30. As the day progressed, it became evident that I would eat better on this period of punishment from Mott than I'd eaten yet since coming to Farthenwood. Tobias snuck me back better than half of his breakfast, and Errol left some food in my room while cleaning up, expressing false dismay after I ate that it was food intended for somebody else. We were to remain in our room in private study because of Princess Amarinda being in the house, but after lunch was brought to us, Tobias gave me all of his lunch and Rodin shared half. You owe me nothing, I said to Rodin. Not now, but if Connor does choose you, then I hope you'll make the same promise to me that you did with Tobias to save my life. And will you make that promise to me as well? I asked him. Rodin shrugged. I can't make Connor do what I want, not even if I were king. I clapped Rodin on the shoulder. Then for the sake of my life, I'll have to continue hoping to be named the prince. Near us, Tobias's feet dropped to the floor and he banged on the door for his servant. When he arrived, Tobias said he had to use the toilet, the only reason we could be allowed out of the room. Even our lessons would be held in this room for the day. Do you think Tobias is so angry that he'll try to kill you again? Rodin asked after Tobias had gone. He wasn't trying to kill me last night. He just wanted me to think he could. Same thing as far as I'm concerned. Though I guess in the end, it worked out better for you. Oh. Rodin's eyes widened. Did you plan for that to happen? Tobias was getting desperate. Once he took the knife when we were in the kitchen, I knew something was bound to happen soon. Why didn't you just report that he had a knife? There's forgiveness for that. But Connor wouldn't forgive what he did last night, and Tobias knows it so he had to agree to my terms. Rodin slowly shook his head. You let him cut you. A smile spread across my mouth. Well, I let him make the first cut. I thought that'd scare him into stopping. I wish it had, because it really did hurt. Rodin laughed and shook his head incredulously. You're the craziest person I've ever met. Tobias may be more educated than you, but he's not the smartest of us. I chuckled, but Rodin turned serious and added, It really is down to you and me, Sage. I've still got to try to win. You know that. It's cruel, this game of ours, I said. Between us, you're Connor's favorite now. Rodin nodded. You can bait me all you want. I won't try to kill you. You could, though, I said. I've seen you out practicing swords with Cregan. Cregan hopes Connor chooses me and he wants me to be ready for when he does. Rodin's voice raised in pitch. What's wrong with that? Nothing. I'm just glad to hear you're practicing for Connor's benefit and not mine. I'm running out of places to get hurt. I don't see why that's funny. I think you must like the pain, because you're constantly pushing people until they hurt you. I definitely don't like the pain, I said firmly. So if you do decide to kill me, make it quick. Rodin's laugh came without humor, and we finished lunch with little more conversation. When Tobias returned a few minutes later, Master Graves had already arrived and begun a particularly dreary lesson on the great books and fine art of Carthia. Tobias lay on his bed for the entire lesson, causing Master Graves to remark that he never thought he'd see a lazier student than me. I felt a little sorry for Tobias, watching him pretend to be less than he was. But unfortunately, that was his situation now. Errol and the other two servants came in mid-afternoon to get us ready for the charade of being servants to Princess Amarinda that evening. Why so early? Rodin asked. You may have been clean orphans this week, his servant told him. But you're still orphans. It'll take a bit more cleaning up to make you worthy of the betrothed princess. Have you seen her? I asked. If he had, the servant wouldn't acknowledge it. But while he gathered my clothes, Errol whispered to me, I've seen her. She looks as beautiful as any princess could. You should feel lucky to be able to serve her tonight. I was too tired to feel lucky, or to care what the princess looked like. I told Errol he could take my place tonight, which he said was fine if I'd do the laundry in his place. That was the end of our bargaining. 
Making us worthy servants included trimming the uneven ends of our hair so that it would tie back neatly, filing our nails, and lecturing us on the importance of always standing up straight around anyone we served. Unfortunately for Errol's best efforts on my behalf, the shorter side of my hair refused to stay out of my face. Finally, he gave up and told me to keep it pushed back whenever I was around the princess. We both knew I probably wouldn't. When we were finished, they placed us in front of mirrors. Our white undershirts were cut closer to the arms, to avoid the sleeves touching any of the food as it was served. The vests we wore over them were simple, earth-colored, and laced up the front, and the boots were low and second-hand. I snorted a laugh. Everything here is about costumes. We don't know the first thing about being servants, but they've certainly dressed us for the part. This is my part, Tobias mumbled beside me. Now. I like them. Rodin twisted in an attempt to see how he looked from the back. It's easier to move in these than the clothes Connor has had us in all week. Mott entered the room and surveyed each of us. I wondered if he'd polished his bald head. It looked shinier than usual, and he wore clothes nearly as fancy as Connor's. He was to be distinguished tonight as something more than a servant, though still not worthy to sit at the table. With a very stern voice, he said, as long as none of you does anything stupid, I believe tonight will be successful. Here are some things each of you must remember. Never address a master first, and never look them in the eye unless they are speaking specifically to you. You follow my directions, and never take any initiative with the princess unless I order it. Looking straight at me, Mott added, You three must remember that you are in disguise. The worst thing that could happen would be for the princess to remember meeting you here tonight after you are presented at court. That cut is still evident on your face, Sage. It'll be healed by the time I'm presented at court, I said. Besides, Imogen once served us with a bruise on her cheek, so this should only help me fit in better with the other servants. Mott didn't rise to my remark. And how are the wounds on your back, specifically the one caused by the window? If I'd had more to eat today, they'd probably be healing faster. Mott smirked and glanced at Errol for an answer. No signs of infection, sir, Errol reported. That's good, Mott said, because I'd expect a dirty window to have caused infection. I did hear that a knife was missing from the kitchen last night, one of the chef's sharpest blades. Those are kept very clean. Only one knife was missing? Tobias glanced at me and then quickly looked away when I tilted my head in response to his silent question. He whispered something under his breath. I'm sure some sort of curse aimed at me. That wasn't a problem. The devils were used to receiving curses with my name on them. One knife, Mott said, walking over to stand directly in front of Tobias. With a blade about as long as Sage's wound. Do you know anything about it? Tobias took a step backward, and his eyes darted around as he searched for a response, but I spoke up. None of us would know where the chef misplaced the knife, and fortunately, I have no intention of going out that particular window again, so there should be no injuries in the future. Mott scoffed, making it clear he didn't believe me, but all he said was, Line up behind your servants, boys. The dinner will be ready soon. 31. Connor's dinner that night was served in the Great Hall, not the dining room where we'd eaten all week. Several guests were already there, but the princess and her parents, who apparently had accompanied her to Farthenwood, had not yet entered. I was assigned as a door servant, with no apparent function other than to stand beside the doors of the Great Hall and observe as other servants came and went. Tobias's and Rodin's assignment was no better. They stood at the far end of the room, tasked with the job of closing the curtains if the setting sun got in anyone's eyes. Mott announced Princess Amarinda's arrival, along with the entrance of her parents and some of their courtiers. Amarinda was as beautiful as Connor had described her, with chestnut brown hair swept away from her face and falling in thick curls down her back, and piercing brown eyes that absorbed her surroundings. As she recognized Connor, her entire face lit up with a smile that was warm and inviting. Here, in Connor's home, 
the guest had made the owner feel welcome, Connor stood, along with the others at his table, and bowed to Princess Amarinda and to her parents. Master Graves had told us about them, and how Amarinda came to be the betrothed princess. The alliance between Amarinda and the house of King Eckbert was made at her birth. She was three years younger than Darius, and the product of a lengthy search by Eckbert, he wanted a foreign girl whose connections were powerful enough to forge a marriage that would create a bond between her country and Carthia, but not a direct heir to the throne, who would have political ambitions of her own. Amarinda was a niece to the king of Bymar. Before she was even old enough to crawl as an infant, her parents had promised her to whoever inherited Eckbert's throne, most likely Darius. And although she'd never been given a choice in marriage, the older Amarinda became, the more her admiration for Darius grew. Both were said to be eager for the time when she would be of age and they could marry. Amarinda stopped when she passed me beside the door. What are you staring at? Whatever rules Mott had given us blurred in my head. I could speak to her if she was addressing me, but she was only addressing me because I'd looked right at her, which was not allowed. Forgive him, Highness, Mott said, stepping forward. No forgiveness is requested. I merely wondered what a servant found so interesting. I looked to Mott to see if I should answer. With a stern warning in his eyes, he nodded permission at me, and I said, You've got dirt on your face. She arched her eyebrows. Is that a joke? No, your highness. On your cheek? Amarinda turned to her attendant, who flushed and wiped the dirt off. Why didn't you tell me before I walked in here? Amarinda asked her. You led the way, highness. I didn't see it. But he did, and he's only a servant. She turned back to me apologetically. Before leaving my room, I had the window open and paused to look out. I must have gotten some dirt on my face then. I never said the dirt detracted from your beauty, Highness, I told her, only that it was there. With a somewhat embarrassed smile, she nodded at me in return, and then continued on, taking her seat. Out of the corner of my eye, I caught Connor looking at me, though his expression was so controlled I couldn't tell whether he was amused, relieved, or furious. Dinner smelled so good as it was served, that it took considerable willpower not to reveal that I was in disguise at that moment and to sit down to eat with the others. A large roast had been prepared, with boiled carrots and potatoes, hot bread, and some sort of imported cheese, the name of which I didn't recognize when Connor offered it to Amarinda. Imogen was one of the servants of the meal. I noticed a cut on her forehead and wondered if Connor would dismiss that as yet another clumsy moment. No matter how long I stared at her as she served, she avoided my eye each time she entered or exited the room. Had I offended her somehow? Or was she keeping herself away from the increasing danger that surrounded Connor's plans? Across the room, Tobias was disinterested and lackluster. He stared at the floor and soon faded into the background. Rodin looked hungry, and I caught him staring at the princess with a powerful expression of admiration. The conversation at the table began with shallow pleasantries. Connor described his life in the country, away from the politics of Drilliad. Amarinda discussed her travels as she toured Carthia in the recent weeks. Her parents understood that as an heir to the throne, she was far more important than they were, and deferred to her in leading the conversation. After the main course was served, Connor steered the conversation directly to the topic I was sure he had intended for us to hear the plans for her eventual wedding and ascension to the throne. Amarinda pressed her lips together, then said, Perhaps there will never be a wedding. She glanced over at Connor, who feigned appropriate concern. After a moment, she added, There is a rumor that came to me only a few days ago regarding the king and queen, and their son. Oh? Connor's wide eyes actually looked curious. He knew exactly what that rumor was and I couldn't help but respect his acting skills. You haven't heard it? I was told the king and queen and their son are touring the northern country, which they often do at this time of year. And may I ask when you last saw them? It's been a few weeks, Connor said, before their trip to Galen. And they were well? Certainly. Amarinda's father spoke up. 
then the rumor cannot be true. He heaved a sigh of relief and took his wife's hand. She also looked relieved. Rumors have always surrounded the royal family, Connor said, as if the matter were settled. It's the cheapest entertainment for everyday folk. There was laughter at the table, except for Amarinda, whose solemn voice took control of the room. I heard they're dead. Murdered. The laughter fell silent, and she continued. All three of them, poisoned during supper and dead by morning. Mott glanced at me from his position and shook his head, warning me not to react. I forced a disinterested blank expression onto my face, despite the churning in my stomach. If I reacted, Connor would change the subject, but I needed them to continue talking about it, because no matter how easily he could avoid giving us more details, he'd have a harder time dodging the princess. However, the one question at the top of my mind was one I knew she'd never ask. Would the person who steps in as the prince become the next victim? Connor leaned forward and clasped his hands together. Highness, you are scheduled to be at the castle in Drilliad tomorrow, correct? When she nodded, he said, Let the rumor lie until then. Whether it's true or false, it will be verified once you're there. Waiting is more easily said than done. Amarinda's voice was heavy with sadness. If there's no heir... There's no betrothed princess. I'll be a widow without having married. Even if the rumor is true, there may be another way, Connor said. Perhaps all is not lost for you, or for Carthia. Amarinda arched an eyebrow, curious. Connor waited several seconds to continue, which I knew was to increase her anticipation. It was heartless, even cruel. Finally, he said, what if Prince Jaren were alive? Amarinda froze. Everyone at the table did, except Connor, who was enjoying this moment far too well. He manipulated those around him as though we were all pawns in his twisted game. I hated that my life had become entwined with his. Finally, Amarinda's mother said, Everyone knows Prince Jaren was killed by pirates four years ago. Are you telling us this is not so? I'm only saying that there is always hope. Connor then addressed himself to Amarinda. Highness, perhaps you may soon claim the throne after all. Am I that shallow? Amarinda stood, angry. Do you think I cared about the throne and not the prince? You talk about Jaren's return as if it would solve all our problems. But it's Darius who concerns me. I need to know if he is alive. She closed her eyes a moment, regaining calm then said more softly, You must forgive me, but I'd like to return to my room. I have a headache. Her father rose to escort her out, but she raised a hand to stop him. No, father. You should stay and continue the evening. My ladies will accompany me. My man will see you to your room, Connor said, gesturing at Mott. Amarinda eyed me, and I lowered my head, willing her to look anywhere else. That boy can see me there. Connor hesitated, then smiled and nodded his permission at her. I wondered if perhaps he wasn't allowed to refuse her, or maybe he liked her suggestion. I didn't. I don't know the way, Highness, I said. It was a stupid lie, and poorly told. Hers was the room where I had bathed on my first day at Farthenwood. I do. All I ask is for an escort. Connor waved me away. So I bowed to her and we walked out into Connor's great hallway. I led the way up the master staircase, which seemed endless on this trip. All I wanted was to take her to her room, then get away. Behind me, Amarinda said, You've obviously never escorted royalty before. Do you expect me to keep up with you at this speed? I set the pace, boy. I stopped, but did not turn around. My apologies, I mumbled. You do not have my forgiveness yet. Let's see how you do from here. When she was close behind me, I continued walking, slower this time. What is your name? She asked. Sage? That's it. I'm a servant, Highness. Do I require more of a name? I am known to most only as Amarinda. Am I a servant as well? She supplied her own answer. Of course I am. 
I exist only to ensure there is a reputable queen for Carthia when the time comes. Have you heard of Prince Darius? Of course. Have you heard the rumors of his death? I've heard them. And they weren't rumors. She touched my arm to get my attention. I stopped, but kept my gaze low. Is he really dead, Sage? If you know, you must tell me. Perhaps you know someone who works in the castle at Drilliad. Surely you servants talk with one another. For the first time, I turned to face her, though I didn't dare look her in the eyes. The servants wonder what Amarinda will do if she has to marry Prince Jaren to gain the throne. If he is alive, of course. Amarinda didn't answer for a very long time. Finally, she said, You speak too boldly for a servant. I continued walking again. Amarinda caught up to me and said, Is Jaren really alive? Whether the king's family is living or dead, if Jaren is alive, he must be presented at court. I stopped in front of Amarinda's door, still keeping my eyes on the floor. Here's your room, milady. You told me you didn't know where it was. And quickly realized what a stupid lie it had been. Rather than respond to her, I asked, Is there anything else you need? Do you wonder why I asked you to escort me, Sage? I shook my head and might have sighed a little too loudly. My back hurt from so much standing. I hadn't eaten yet and I was tired of pretending. Beyond that, I didn't want to hear that a girl who'd have to marry me one day, if I was declared Prince Jaren, really loved the prince's older brother. I ask you here because you spoke honestly to me before. If I'd enter that room with a face smeared in mud and asked another servant how I looked, he'd have bowed and told me I looked as beautiful as ever. When you're in my position, Sage, you come to realize how few people you can trust. She waited expecting me to respond. When met with silence, she went on. So I trust your opinion on my dilemma. Should I continue on to Drilliad, hoping Prince Darius will greet me there, but knowing in my heart that something is wrong? Or shall I stay away, knowing that if there is no Darius, I am no longer a betrothed princess and have no place in Drilliad? This time I looked directly at her. Although her eyes were so perceptive, I immediately looked away again. You should go to the castle, Highness. You should always choose on the side of hope. That's good advice. I have less of a headache now than before, Sage. Thank you for that. She smiled sadly. Do you envy me as a royal? I shook my head. The closer I got to the castle in Drilliad myself, the more I dreaded it. Many do. I'm glad you can appreciate your station in life as a servant. I'm a servant too, you know, perhaps with finer clothes and servants of my own, but few choices about my life belong to me. We're not so different, you and I. She was closer to the truth than she realized, but I held my tongue and stared at the ground. Will you not look at me? No, my lady. If I cannot look at you as an equal, I will not look at all. She placed a hand on my cheek and softly kissed the other one, then whispered, Remember this moment then, Sage, when someone of my status offered a kindness to someone of yours. Because next time we meet, if Darius is dead, I will no longer be anyone of importance. Then she entered the room with her ladies in tow. Only after her door was shut did I look up again. Darius was dead, and very soon she and I would meet as equals. But I had the feeling it wouldn't be a day she ended up celebrating. 32. Where are you going? Maud asked as I began walking away. He was never far behind. To my room, my back hurts. How will it look to everyone at dinner if the servant who left with Amarinda fails to return? How will it look if that servant's bandages bleed through and he drips blood on Connor's dining table? Come on, Mott said with a sigh.
I'll walk you to your room. You don't have to. I know the way. Saving you from getting lost is not the reason I'm here. Tell me, what did you think of the betrothed princess? I think she loves Darius. There's plenty of time for her to learn to love Jaren. Besides, this is the way of life for royals. They do their duty to their country, and if they are very lucky, it will sometimes bring them happiness. I don't want anyone to do their duty for me. I grumbled. A charade like that is not for her. Connor is preparing you to wear a mask for the rest of your life, Mott said. It's better that your queen pretends to love you, because if she truly did, she would only love a lie. That hardly made me feel better. Errol was sitting on the bench just outside my bedroom door. He stood as he saw us coming. Are you ill? He asked me. Get me some dinner, I growled, pushing past him to enter my room. And no, I don't need help dressing. Ironically, I did need help. My shoulders and back had stiffened over the past few hours of standing, and with every movement, I felt like my wounds might tear open again. When Errol returned with a tray of food several minutes later, he found me sitting on the floor with an unbuttoned shirt and vest. Errol set the tray on Tobias's desk, and then silently went to the wardrobe to gather my nightclothes. He was able to pull off my shirt without causing me too much pain, and, without asking, checked my bandages. Imogen is occupied at the dinner downstairs, he said. You must let me clean those wounds. They look hot. I leaned forward, which took less work than arguing. He soaked a towel in the alcohol and pressed it to my back. I arched it with the inevitable sting, then relaxed as it slowly passed. Every servant at Fartherwood knows Tobias cut you, Errol murmured. I'd be surprised if the master doesn't hear of it soon. The servants are mistaken. I was trying to climb out a window. We hear things, Sage, more than anyone knows. Then you obviously know why Rodin and Tobias and I are here. Are Connor's servants loyal to him? To this plan? Shortly after you came, Connor impressed upon us the sacred nature of what he's doing. How important it is to Carthia. To be sure, he threatened us dearly if word of his plan leaks outside Farthenwood. But he shouldn't worry, nor should you. This is a secret we will all carry to our graves. If you are chosen as prince, I will treat you just as I would a true royal. With that, he finished bandaging me up. He pulled my nightclothes on, and even fastened them in front, which I was more than capable of doing. When he stood to leave, I said, Thanks for helping tonight, Errol. Thanks for helping every night. I know I'm difficult. I'll take that as an apology, sir. Your dinner is on the desk there. Good night. I was in bed when Rodin and Tobias came into the room. Tobias entered more quietly than usual and lay down on his bed indifferently. Rodin crossed over to me and said, Connor was furious that you didn't return to the dining room tonight. I heard him ask Mott to come get you right now. I groaned. How can he expect us to see ourselves as royalty when he treats us as slaves? Errol entered the room and began rummaging through my drawers. I'm sorry, Sage, but it's true. Connor has asked to see you. Mott is waiting outside to take you to see him. I winced as I rolled out of bed. Errol held up clothes for me, but I shook my head. If he asks for me at night, he'll find me in night clothes. It's inappropriate, Errol said. And it's indecent of him to summon me when he knows I'm asleep. I opened the door to leave but Mott blocked the doorway and shook his head at me. I won't bring you to the master like that. Allow Errol to dress you, or I'll do it. I shut the door in his face and held out my arms to Errol, who hurried forward, clothes in hand. Minutes later, Mott was walking me, fully dressed, down to Connor's office. Am I in trouble? I asked. That depends on your answers to his questions. Connor was in the middle of writing something when we entered his office. Mott directed me to stand in front of his desk, but I sat. A minute or two passed before Connor even acknowledged I was there. Finally, he set the quill down and looked up at me. What did you think of her? The princess? I shrugged. She's beautiful. I'd heard the betrothed princess was more horse than woman. 
By your words, Connor hissed, you're speaking of the future queen of Carthia. That is, if the prince is found. And yes, she has most unexpectedly become a beautiful young woman. Why did she choose you to escort her out? Because I told her about the spot of dirt on her face before. I think she appreciated the honesty. You're lucky she did. She might as easily have had you whipped for being disrespectful. I've already been whipped. And stabbed, I hear. Mott has my story on that incident, sir. A story which is probably a lie. At Farthenwood, lies and truth blur together. Only lies in pursuit of the truth, Sage. My body ached with tiredness. All I wanted was to finish this pointless conversation and go back to sleep. But there was one question I needed answered. Why did you allow me to go with her? When you bring me to court, she'll recognize me. If I bring you to court, don't mistake my tolerance for you as any sort of favoritism. Quite the contrary. My question stands, sir. Why did you allow me to go with her? The possibility of her recognizing you did concern me for a moment. Then I decided you can easily explain that I kept you in hiding here until you could be presented at court. The fact that you two already met could be seen as an advantage. Now I have some questions for you. I have a few more questions first. Connor arched an eyebrow. Oh? What if Prince Jaren is alive? Then he returns to the castle to find me sitting on his throne. I don't think he'll appreciate that. Jaren is dead. I told you once before that I have proof of it. Besides, the pirates off the coast of Avenia are ruthless. The reason no body was ever found is because they likely destroyed everything identifiable about him. Whatever trouble he may have caused his family, the king and queen loved Jaren. The queen in particular never gave up searching for any trace of him in the years that followed. It was all in vain. I doubt he was even alive by the time his ship sunk. What's your proof? I present that to the boy I choose as prince, and to nobody else. If you can prove Jaren's dead, then can you also prove to the regents that Jaren survived? At court, Jaren will confess that he has been hiding all these years in an orphanage, right under their noses. He went by the name of Sage, or Rodin, or Tobias, but he has come back now to claim the throne. What if another orphan steps forward to say he knew us before Jaren was killed? We would say they are mistaken, and perhaps one night that orphan would disappear. Thrones have been claimed over thinner evidence than we have, Sage. Besides, my prince will have evidence of his identity. What? Connor shook his head slightly. I'll save that answer until my prince is chosen, but rest assured... It is something that will identify my choice as the prince without doubt. Now to my questions. What did Princess Amarinda talk with you about after you two left? She's worried that the king's family is dead, despite your assurances that she shouldn't worry. She doesn't seem to believe there's any hope of Jaren being alive, and I don't think she'd want him even if he were. She's afraid, sir. Connor smiled. We can use that to our advantage. Use her fear to make her more apt to accept the prince when I present him, so that even if she has doubts, she'll accept him because she needs it to be true. I couldn't hide my disdain as I glared at him. It was disgusting that he'd think so quickly of how he might benefit from her pain. Don't make that face at me, Connor cried. How convenient it must be for you to play the pious victim when it benefits you, or to be the prince, or the servant, or the orphan. Yet I must at all times be the keeper of this unholy plan. I do not celebrate my role in Carthia's future, but I've accepted it. Have you? And the expression vanished from my face. Yes, sir, I have. I am your prince. You think too highly of yourself. Tobias can no longer be trusted. But Rodin presents some fine advantages. I believe he has been underestimated this week. He has learned more than any of you in such a short time. There was nothing I could say to that. He had. Connor continued. What I wonder is if you want to be the prince. I sense you battling that decision internally, perhaps because you're afraid of the consequences of being caught, perhaps because you cannot picture yourself sitting on the throne. 
And yet here you are, telling me to my face that you are my prince. I threw out a hand, then immediately regretted the gesture when the movement pinched in my back. Would you choose Rodin, who rushes toward the throne with no thought of the consequences? He has no idea what he's accepting. I have thought about it, Connor, and I am your prince. Connor clasped his hands together and a glint of triumph flickered in his eyes. I believe that what I suspected all along was true. All you ever needed was the proper discipline and the right motivation. I can see that you are finally bending to my will. And that pleases me. It did not please me. Tired as I was, I still had plenty of energy to be angry with his smugness. However, I simply asked, Can I go now? He hesitated a moment, then nodded, and I left without looking at him. As Mott escorted me back to my room, he tried to make conversation, but I ignored him. Connor's words still rang in my ears. With every step closer to the throne I took, I felt myself bending too. I only hoped I could get to the end before Connor broke me completely. 33. Amarinda left with her entourage early the next morning, and our tutoring schedule resumed. Rodin's reading wasn't fluent, but he was amazing, considering how recently he'd begun learning. I thought he would be good enough to get by if Connor chose him as prince. Mott pulled me out of Mistress Havala's class to work on sword fighting with him, even though I insisted I couldn't fight with my back and bandages. If we wait for a full healing, it'll be too late, he said. We'll both use wooden swords today. He took one for himself and tossed me the other. I jumped away from it and it landed in the dirt. Afraid of a wooden sword? Mott teased. Just demonstrating my skills in evading an attack, I said a grin tugging at the edge of my mouth. Impressed? No, pick it up. When I complied, Mott stepped me through the basic defensive moves. If you can't attack like Jaren, at least I can teach you to defend yourself. He thrust his sword at me. I moved mine in an attempt to block it, but his went right past mine and jabbed my ribs. You're worse than when I last saw you, Mott said. You shouldn't have whipped me so hard. You shouldn't have let yourself get stabbed. I smiled and swung my sword low to the left, getting in a swat on his thigh. Not bad, Mott said, but you lack the discipline that would be expected of a prince. I could always say that I'm out of practice. Nonsense. Prince Jaren was an amazing swordsman for his age before he disappeared. You cannot be as pathetic as you are now and hope to pass for him. Why do you think his sword was made? I blocked his attempt to graze my shoulder, maybe to encourage him to take his studies more seriously. Jaren always took sword fighting seriously. He is known to have once declared in front of the entire court that he intended to lead the Carthian armies in war one day. Then he sounds like a fool, I said, thrusting forward. Mott dodged me and easily blocked my move. Mistress Havala said that Eckbert was a peaceable ruler at all costs. Carthia has avoided war for generations. Carthia has enemies, Sage. Darius understood that. Perhaps Jaren did as well. Their father never did. Are you saying Eckbert was a bad king? He wasn't evil, just naive. Each year his enemies have grown stronger, forged alliances, stockpiled their weapons. Eckbert failed to see their hungry eyes as they looked toward Carthia. Mott shrugged. He failed to see the enemies within his own castle. I used the opportunity to jab at his side, then followed it with a slice that threw his sword off balance. Ma backed up two steps and readjusted his grip. Good move, Sage. Very unexpected. I fought better with Jaren's sword, I said. You fought better because it was a superior sword, even as an imitation. It's too bad that it's been taken. Connor now believes it wasn't any of you three boys. He thinks one of the servants took it to sell, knowing you boys would get the blame for it. Cregan probably took it to help train Rodin. Unlikely. You dislike Cregan, Sage, but he serves Connor well. He'd do anything Connor asked. So would you. Mott stopped and lowered his sword. I wouldn't kill for him. That's my limit. 
I couldn't let that go unanswered. Then your limits are meaningless. Cregan killed Latimer on Connor's orders, and you helped it happen. That's the same thing. Something flickered in Mott's eyes. He pressed his lips together and said, Our lesson is over. Hang up your sword and I'll walk you back to the house. The rest of the day was taken up with lessons. So much information was being pushed into our heads that it's a wonder none of them exploded. Tobias was eventually sent back to our room as punishment for sleeping during the lesson, and he was clearly relieved to be going. That gave a burst of energy to Rodin, who saw it as his chance to be the star student. After all, I wasn't much more interested than Tobias had been. Tobias stopped me in the hall as we were being escorted to dinner with Connor that evening. You remember your promise to me, right? You'll make sure I live through this. That's still my promise, I said. Tobias exhaled a sigh of relief. Then let me help you become the prince. What do you need? I want nothing from you, Tobias. Just loyalty, if I'm chosen. Tobias lowered his voice further. I wasn't going to kill you the other night. I never had any intention of doing that. The knife was sharper than I thought. What I thought was only a surface wound. It will heal. I think Mott suspects the truth. Maybe Connor, too. You have my promise, Tobias. You will live. I trust you. Tobias paused, as if he were weighing his own words. I do, Sage. I trust you. Keep up, you two, Mott called back to us. Connor is waiting. We caught up to Rodin and Mott shortly before we arrived at the dining room. Once there, Mott opened the door to allow Rodin and Tobias in, but he put a hand on my shoulder to hold me back and shut the door again. My heart raced, but I tried to keep my expression calm. Mott looked very serious, and I had no trouble thinking of any number of reasons why he might be about to punish me. Whatever you think I've done... I began, but he shook his head to silence me. I didn't know he was going to kill Latimer, Mott said in a low voice. You had it figured out before I did. The memory of Latimer turning just before he was struck with Cregan's arrow was burned into my mind. It was relentless in my dreams at night, and haunted my steps in the day. If only I'd realized what was happening a few seconds earlier, it might have been enough to save him. Why are you telling me this? I asked. He shrugged. I guess I just wanted you to know that I remember what you said down in the dungeons. Connor doesn't own me either. Connor had news for us that evening. Do you remember when we spoke of the Prime Regent Veldegrath? He is the one who aspires to become king, the one we must prevent from taking the throne because of the damage he will do to Carthia. I received an interesting letter from him tonight, which is both distressing and encouraging. To illustrate, Connor held up a few papers, which I assumed was Veldegrath's letter. The encouraging news is that he has heard the rumor that Prince Jaren may be alive. I knew he was meeting Princess Amarinda earlier today, to travel with her as far as Eberstein on the outskirts of Driliad, where he maintains a home. I expect she told him. This bodes well for my prince's acceptance at court, if it is less of a surprise when I announce him. And the bad news? I asked. The bad news is that word is also spreading of the king's and queen's deaths. A decision cannot be made as to who will take the throne until the end of this week, but Veldegrath will use the fear of their deaths to build up more support for himself. He wrote to ask me whether I have any solid information as to Prince Jaren's whereabouts. My response to him was nonspecific, which will test his patience, but it does buy us another day. Another day for what? Tobias asked. Connor took a deep breath, and then said, I will choose my prince in two days' time, then we will leave immediately for Driliad. Tobias, Rodin, and I looked at one another. There was surprisingly little enthusiasm from any of us, and Connor noticed. I might have expected some excitement, he said. What will become of the two boys who aren't chosen? I asked. Connor paused. Then he said, I haven't decided that yet. Everyone in the room knew that was a lie. 34. The night passed without incident, 
If Tobias and Rodin knew I'd snuck out during the night, neither of them mentioned it the next morning. After breakfast, Mott entered the room and said Connor had new plans for us that day. He carried something in his arms, which he unwrapped and set on an easel in front of us. It was a painting of a boy standing beside a tall hedge in a springtime garden. He had light brown hair with darker streaks underneath, a mischievous smile, and a hint of trouble in his bright green eyes. None of us had his innocence, his naivete. Is that Jaren? Rodin asked. The last known picture of him, Mott said, painted more than five years ago, when the prince was nine years old. I couldn't help but stare, comparing myself to every detail of the painting. Rodin and Tobias were studying it as carefully, no doubt doing the same thing. Each of us had features that looked similar to the prince's, but Rodin groaned in disgust. Sage looks more like him than Tobias and I. Connor led me to believe just the opposite. Do you see a resemblance? Maud asked me. I shrugged. My face is longer, and my hair is the wrong color. If anyone compares me to that picture, the regents won't believe I'm him. This brought on even louder complaints from Rodin, as well as a few objections from Tobias, that none of us was enough like the picture to be convincing. Mott shushed us, then continued. Connor's plan this morning is for each of you to undergo whatever transformation you can to look like the prince. Your hair will be cut to match his. Sage, we have a hair dye that may work for you. You will each be measured and clothes will be prepared for the one Connor chooses. By the time one of you is chosen tomorrow morning, he will look like the prince. While Rodin and Tobias got their hair cut, Errol led me outside to work the dye through my hair. It will look like I've used hair dye, I said. And what about when my hair grows back into its color again? Master Connor believes you can use less and less dye each time, Errol said. Within a year, it will appear as if your hair has naturally changed color. He thinks of everything, I said without any hint of admiration. I had no mirror to see myself once the dye was washed out some time later, but Errol smiled when he looked at me and seemed pleased. It's amazing how that one thing has brought your appearance so much closer to the prince's. I'm certain Connor will choose you. Most of us servants believe that. Which would have been comforting if we hadn't passed Connor in his office with Rodin as we walked back in. Rodin was kneeling before Connor at his desk. His hair was styled just as Jaren's had been and he looked very nice. If there were inconsistencies between his look and Jaren's, they could easily be explained by the changes in a face over time. I am exceptionally impressed, Connor was saying to him. You have surprised me, Rodin, and pleased me. Tobias, any similarities between you and the prince have vanished. Do not consider your chances of being chosen tomorrow to be good. No, sir, Tobias said. I hadn't even seen him in the room. He must have been beyond our vantage point. Ah, Sage, Connor said, noticing us at the door. It seems that once again you're behind the others. I still find myself looking at an orphan, albeit one with the same hair color as the prince. I am your prince, I told Connor, then walked on past his office. Errol caught up to me and whispered, Perhaps I was wrong to have said that Connor would choose you. You might be too late. With my hair cut and styled an hour later, I gasped when Errol handed me a mirror. Errol's wide eyes hinted at his equal amazement. The resemblance is so strong, you could almost be Jaren's twin, he said. I couldn't stop staring. Was this really me? I was too accustomed to hiding my eyes behind my hair and feeling dirty and grimy. Had Connor known this was possible when he first took me? Had he seen through all that? Take me to see Connor, I said. You walk differently. Errol observed as he followed me down the hallway a moment later. You are different, Sage. Let's hope Connor sees things the same way. Connor's office door, which was usually open, was closed this time. I think we should come back, Errol said. I rolled my eyes and knocked on the door. Enter, Connor said from his office. I opened the door. Mott was sitting on the chair in front of Connor at his desk, but turned to see who had come. He stood when I entered, as did Connor. Connor said nothing for several seconds. His eyes scanned me up and down, 
and his mouth hung open. It can't be, he said. More than I'd hoped for. I told him he could be the prince's twin, Errol said. Connor's eyes flashed at Errol. Get out! Errol nodded and vanished from the doorway. He'd made a mistake by openly acknowledging that he knew about the plan. It didn't matter that Connor was the one who told them about it in the first place. Kneel, please, Connor said. I wish to study you better. Come as close to me as you'd like, I answered. Study me here, on my feet. You won't kneel, would a prince? Connor raised his voice. You're not a prince until I say so. I don't need you to say so, sir. As you see me standing here, I am the Prince of Carthia. I turned to walk out of the room, but Cregan flew past me through the doorway. Master Connor, he said in breathless words. You were right. Veldegrath is coming. How far away did you see him? Maud asked. Several miles off, but he wasn't alone. He has an entire company of men with him. Soldiers? Not in uniform, but they're armed. Connor nodded. I could almost see plans forming in his mind like storm clouds gathering. He wants to intimidate us, not fight, so we must welcome him in with all hospitality. Get word to the staff to prepare a meal large enough for him and his company, and remind them not to speak of my plans unless they all want to hang for treason. Then he turned to Mott. Find the three boys. Hide them in my secret tunnels. I know about them, sir, I said. I can take us there. Connor looked surprised only for a moment. Then he nodded and said, Sage, you must find Rodin and Tobias and hide in the deepest of my tunnels. I don't need to tell you what will happen if you are found. Mott, go to their room. Destroy any trace of the boy's presence here. I began to leave, but Connor said, Wait! He opened the bottom drawer of his desk and withdrew a small locked box decorated in emeralds. Take this with you. Do not open it and do not let it get into Veldegraff's hands. Cregan, Mott, and I each ran our separate ways. In the library, I found Tobias and Rodin, who stood when I entered. You look so... different, Tobias said. I admit I, I couldn't see the resemblance to the prince before, but now... Veldegraff is coming, I said. You must come with me at once. What's the hurry? Tobias said, putting his book away. Connor can declare you or Rodin as prince and resolve his plan today. As they followed me upstairs, I answered them. Veldegrath is the last person in this kingdom who wants to see Prince Jaren return. If he finds us, we're all dead. The False Prince, Disc 5 35 I led Tobias and Rodin to an area of the tunnels I had discovered on my last trip. They went deeper than any others and, in one area, placed us beneath Farthenwood's main entrance. The rock foundation of the house was showing its age. Using small gaps in the mortar, we had a limited view outside. Since finding the tunnels, I'd felt Farthenwood was designed for a paranoid man who expected enemies to enter his walls. If Connor's father had built this house, he had no doubt made his son just as paranoid. From where we stood, we could see the approach of Veldegrath and his men. They were at least fifty in number, and each carried a sword, but they were still too far away for us to tell which of them was Veldegrath. It's an act of war for Veldegrath to do this, Tobias said. Only if Connor doesn't invite him in, which he's going to do, Rodin said. Connor thinks the army is only for intimidation, I said. We have no means to fight him. So hopefully Veldergrath only intends this to be a show of power, maybe to persuade Connor to join him if Carthia does fall to civil war. If Veldegrath wants the throne this badly, he won't give it up easily, Rodin said. Whomever Connor declares as prince will eventually have to face Veldegrath. A moment of silence followed. That idea didn't appeal to any of us. Finally, Tobias said, If you hadn't already forced me out of the plan, Sage, I would have withdrawn right now. Ignoring Tobias, Rodin angled forward to get a better look. That's got to be him, Rodin said. There, in the center. It was obvious by his fine clothes and the men who surrounded him that this was Veldegrath. He had hair the color of midnight, 
which he wore pulled behind his head so tightly that I wondered how he could blink. His face was constructed of hard angles and long lines. I tried to imagine him as king of Carthia. If a person could be judged solely on appearances, this man was a tyrant. Connor walked out to Veldergraf, and they greeted each other with courteous bows. My old friend, Connor called out, loudly enough that we were able to hear him. To what do I owe the honor of your visit? I've heard troubling news about you, old friend. The way Veldergraf voiced old friend, it was clear he considered Connor anything but that. May we speak in private? Certainly. In anticipation of your arrival, I've had my chef make up some soup for your traveling companions. They must be hungry. Perhaps we should eat first, Veldergraf said. I anticipate you'll feel less hospitable to me after we talk business. With that, Connor led Veldergrath and a few men inside, while the rest dismounted as Connor's servants assisted them in caring for their horses. Why does Connor help them? Rodin asked. I'd send them on their way. I'd give them soup, Tobias said, then grinned. I'd use the rottenest meat in my stores and hope they all got sick on it. It's diplomacy. I said, irritated they couldn't see that. It's all Connor can do right now. And for all of our sakes, let's hope it works. Come on. They followed me up another bend in the tunnels to the main floor. We were near a secret door behind a tapestry in Connor's office, where they were certain to have their private meeting. Although their voices would be muffled, we could hear them from where we stood. Tobias whispered, If they eat first, it'll be a while. So we waited. It was impossible to determine the passing of time from here, although with the sting in my back and ache in my legs, it probably felt longer than it really was. Tobias and Rodin wanted to sit, but I reminded them that any position they took now, they would have to maintain after Connor and Veldergrath entered, or risk making a noise that would give us away. So we all stood in silence. After a very long time, we heard Connor's voice as he entered the office. I always feel bad news is better handled on a full stomach. Don't you agree? It's only bad news if you're up to something you shouldn't be. My fists clenched at Veldergrath's arrogance. Even if he was correct in his suspicions, Veldergrath wasn't king yet and had no right to question Connor. We heard the squeak of Connor's chair as he sat and his invitation for Veldergrath to sit as well. Then Connor said, You should explain yourself. Am I accused of doing something wrong? The betrothed princess was here for dinner last night, correct? Yes, she is a lovely young woman. A bit distressed, though, at having heard news about the deaths of the king, queen, and prince Darius. She heard it only as a rumor. Veldergrath huffed. A rumor you and I both know to be fact. Obviously, you could not confirm or deny that to her. But she told me something else you said, some things that I find remarkable. You told her that Prince Jaren may be alive. I believe he is. We sent three regents to Issel to determine this. Have you heard any news from them? No. Then how have you come to this stunning conclusion? Connor hesitated a moment, then said, Old friend, you seem distressed at the possibility. Don't you see what a great advantage it would be to the kingdom if Prince Jaren were alive? Eckbert's line would continue, and Carthia would be saved from certain war. Surely there could be no better news, yet you don't appear to welcome it. Uh, of course. Veldegraff seemed to be taken by surprise, but he recovered quickly. Of course I hope the prince is alive, but you and I both know how impossible that is. My question is not whether we should hope for that news, but how you have come to be so certain of it. Obviously, an accusation follows this question, so why don't we move straight to it? As you wish, Veldegrath said. Master Connor, I'm told you had a sword made, a replica of the one Prince Jaren used to carry. It was an imitation, not a replica. Sadly, I've recently lost it or I could show it to you. I had it made intending it as a gift for the queen's next birthday, in honor of her lost son. There's more. I'm told in the previous week you scoured the orphanages of Carthia and even collected a few boys. Why is that? 
Indentured field laborers. My crops are planted and I needed them. Where are they? Ran away the first time my back was turned. If you know of their whereabouts, please tell me and I will have them punished. Lies fell from his lips as gracefully as raindrops from a cloud. There's one last thing. You sat with the king's family at supper the night they died. Many regents did. But you were given the honor of pouring their drinks. Connor's voice remained calm, despite Veldergraf's clear insinuation that Connor was the one who had poisoned them. And you dished up their pudding, sir. Is there a point to these questions? Perhaps not. Are you aware that there is something missing from the residential quarters of the castle? A box covered with emeralds? My fingers rubbed over those emeralds. Connor must have stolen this box from the king and queen, either shortly before or shortly after their death. I didn't know what was in it, but whatever this box contained, it was probably going to be used as proof that one of us was Prince Jaren. You ask that as if you think I have it, Connor said. I'm certain that you'd never steal from the king, even a dead one, Veldergraf said. But we have friends who are less certain of your character. So to appease the other nobles, who are suspicious of you, I ask your permission to search Farthenwood. Connor laughed. An estate of this size, and you hope to find an emerald-covered box. A box, or a prince. Do I have your permission? Several of your men are rough-looking. They will frighten my staff. No harm will befall any innocents here. Veldegraff's insertion of the word innocence was calculated. That is my promise. Connor's voice was grim as he spoke. Do what you will, Veldegraff. Waste your time in my dusty corners and crowded cellars if you must. You'll find nothing. We didn't dare move until after Veldegraff had left the room. Then Tobias turned to me and hissed. You know these tunnels. Are they safe? All I could do was shrug. I didn't know. 36. Veldergraf's men decided to begin in the dungeons and work their way up. So we made our way to the upper floor, keeping ourselves as far from the men as possible. This is a terrible idea, Tobias whispered as we walked. If they do get into the tunnels, we'll be trapped. Then we go onto the roof and make our escape there, I said. Rodin's eyes widened, but he nodded his agreement. Tobias seemed even more anxious. The roof? And fall to our deaths? I've been there, I said. We won't fall. Then let's go now, Rodin whispered. There's too much chance of us being spotted if he sent men to search the grounds or guard the doors. Veldegrath is no fool, so he must expect that he's done that. Going onto the roof is our last option. We reached the upper floor using a tunnel that put us near the nursemaid's bedroom. I wondered if any children who once lived here had used the tunnels to play tricks on their caregivers. It's what I would have done. Temporarily safe from Veldegraff's men, Rodin nodded at the emerald box in my hands. Is that the box Veldegraff was talking about? Probably. What's in it? It's locked. You don't seem curious, Tobias said. I'd have to break the box to get into it here, and I won't do that. Whatever its contents, we'll find out soon enough. There was a moment of silence, and then Rodin asked, Sage, did you know you look so much like the prince? I always felt I looked more like myself than anyone else. I grinned, then shrugged. I'm too scarred for a prince. Too many calluses and rough edges. A similar face may not be enough. Besides, what we saw is only a painting, an artist's interpretation of what Jaren looked like. Have either of you ever seen the royal family in person? Neither of them had. Rodin observed, quite accurately, that royalty rarely visited orphanages or invited poor orphans to state dinners. The king came through Karchar about a year ago, I said. So I stood on the street to see him. He looked right at me as he passed. I could have sworn he did. Everyone was supposed to bow to him, but I didn't. Why not? Tobias asked. Honestly, Sage, have you no respect? An Avenian bow to a Carthian king? Wouldn't that dishonor the king of Avenia? 
Tobias's groan was muffled by Rodin, who asked, So what happened? A soldier clubbed me across my calves. That sent me to my knees, and I was in no hurry to get up again. For a moment I thought King Eckbert would stop the entire procession, but he didn't. He only shook his head and continued on. Rodin chuckled softly. It's a wonder you've lived so long. If Connor doesn't choose you, it will only be because you're too reckless to trust on the throne. I can't deny that. My point is that people don't always look the same in real life as they do in their paintings. My resemblance to a five-year-old painting doesn't matter. Facing the regents is the real test. We immediately fell silent when footsteps clambered up the stairs near us. How many? Tobias mouthed. I shook my head. Maybe four or five men, but it was impossible to tell for sure. We heard several other men still on the floor below us. They spread out, each of them taking one area of the upper floor to search. One of Connor's servants was with them to open any locked door or cupboard. There's a lot of storage up here, one man said. All the better for a hiding place, another said. Check every trunk beneath every bed. I wouldn't hide a prince in a dusty room like this. We search everywhere, the first man ordered. My spirits lifted a little. There was no mention of secret passageways, which there would have been if any entrances had been found downstairs. It didn't appear they even suspected these tunnels were in the house. Suddenly, Tobias grabbed my arm. He leaned very close to me and whispered, I hid papers in our room. If they find them, they'll know we're here. I threw out my hands in a gesture to ask him where the papers were. He leaned in again. I cut a small hole in the side of my mattress. If they move it, feathers will fall out and they'll see the hole. He drew back with an apologetic look on his face, but I could only shake my head. Judging by the thoroughness of the search on this floor, it was too much a risk that they might find those papers. I motioned for them to stay where they were. My feet would move quietly enough that I could pass through the tunnel undetected. Tobias and Rodin might not. I crept down the narrow stairs of the tunnel. One of the steps was loose, and I was concerned that when I pulled off the wood plank, it would make too much noise, like it had before. There were a few small squeaks, but I moved so slowly they didn't seem to draw any attention. The imitation of Prince Jaren's sword was lodged inside. I hoped I wouldn't have to use it, but I wasn't about to go out there without a weapon of some sort. With the sword in my hand, I inched open the door to our bedroom. A few men still remained on our floor, but they seemed to be nearer to Connor's room. I didn't think they'd come my way yet. Our bedroom had been scrubbed of any evidence of our having been there. Now it looked like a little used guest room. The wardrobes were empty, our books were gone, and the beds were pushed into a line of three near the wall. Tobias's bed was the farthest from my hiding place. I crept along the floor, hardly suitable for a gentleman or whatever Connor had turned me into, but very familiar from my life as an orphan. Once in a conversation with Mrs. Turbledy, I compared myself to a caterpillar that went wherever I wanted with barely any notice. She compared me to a cockroach instead, who ran about freely in the darkness and scattered in the light. It was meant as an insult, but I thought it was a fair comparison even a compliment judging by how hard they are to catch. I crawled beneath what had been my old bed, and then Rodin's, finally to Tobias's, the last in the line. I was about to reach my arm up to feel around his mattress, and then froze. Footsteps were coming down the stairs. We're going to search this floor now, the man in charge of the others said. Chelston, we need your men in here now, someone called from the hallway near Connor's room, there's a lot of heavy furniture in here. So we get the sore backs and he gets the glory in whatever we find. Someone outside my bedroom complained, but they went away. I only had a few minutes. It was simple to find the hole in Tobias's mattress. He'd cut it well, so that it would always remain covered, and so that no feathers would fall from it unless the mattress were overturned. The papers were right inside, tightly folded. I tucked them into my pocket and then crawled back to the doors. I was about to dart safely into the tunnels when a voice said, Did anyone hear that? Like footsteps inside the walls. I rolled my eyes. 
Was it Rodin's or Tobias's carelessness that would reveal us? It sounded as if the man began to call out someone's name. Then he cried out in pain. I pressed myself against the wall, and only a second later, Imogen ran into my room, looking for a place to hide. In her hands was a fireplace poker. She must have hit the man with it. My heart pounded. Imogen had successfully distracted him from the tunnels, but she was about to pay dearly for having saved us. 37. Where are you? The man growled. Imogen backstepped as he entered the room, holding the poker like it was a sword. He was a big man, with a belt that had been stretched to its limits to fit around him. Even to protect us, Imogen never should have attacked him. She had no chance against this man. He advanced and she swung at him, but this time he grabbed the poker. With one twist, he pulled it from her hands and yanked her toward him. Who are you hiding here? He asked. Veldegrath will want to talk to you. Imogen tried to resist his grip, but it was pointless. Finally, she wrenched up her face, then stomped on his foot with all her strength. He released her only for a second and she tried to run, but he grabbed her again and shook her by the shoulders. Oh no, you're coming with me, he snarled. By that time, I had crept to within only a few feet from him, my sword out and ready. Imogen didn't mean to betray me. She glanced my way for only a second, but it was enough. The man pushed her to the floor, and with surprising agility, swung around with the poker, swiping hard enough to make a swishing noise in the air. I ducked to avoid his attack and thrust my blade deep into his gut. He gasped as blood leaked from his wound, then for the first time really looked at me. Prince Jaren, he whispered. Perhaps soon, I said as he toppled over. Imogen ran into my arms, holding me so tightly that she nearly knocked me over. Her entire body was shaking, so I put my arm around her to try to calm her. One hand clawed into my wounded back, which I couldn't have tolerated if it was anybody but her causing me the pain. Then she darted back from me, hearing a sound behind us. I swung around, ready with the sword then lowered it when I saw Mott in the doorway. Mott's eyes went from the man on the floor, to the sword, to me. Drop the sword and get out of here, he whispered. Now! I gently set the sword on the floor, then took Imogen's hand and pulled her into the tunnel. Before I shut the door behind us, I saw Mott use the dead man's knife to stab himself in the arm. Reeling, he pulled the knife out, then fell on the floor. Several of Veldergraf's men ran into the room. What happened here? One of them, a leader of the group, asked. Mott rolled over. Whether he was exaggerating his pain or not, I believed his performance. Your man attacked me, he mumbled. I might have startled him when I came in, but it was only to assist him with unlocking these doors. One of Veldergraf's men knelt down to examine Mott's injury. You're lucky it wasn't deeper. Oh, in a more vital area. I tried to dodge out of the way. He was aiming for my chest. I had to defend myself. You must have provoked him. Mott shook his head. You saw me walk in here. I had no reason to attack this man. Perhaps I should report to your master and mine exactly how this search is going. Get rid of that body, the leader said. Veldegrath doesn't want damage done to Connor's property. One of you clean up this blood. A few men went to look for cleaning supplies, and after wrapping him in sheets from Rodin's bed, it took most of the rest of them to haul the body out of the room. Mott assured them he could get himself bandaged and was soon left alone. He glanced at the crack of the opened passage door I'd been staring through, then nodded at me. I closed the door tightly and sank against the wall with my arms wrapped around my knees. Imogen sat silently beside me. I vaguely felt her presence, but took no notice of it. As it was, all I could do was stare into the darkness and try to keep breathing. Connor said he would let the devils have his soul if it meant succeeding with his plan. I had the feeling that when he did, the souls of all the rest of us would go to the devils too. 38. Imogen and I remained there until the search ended and Veldegraff's company of men left. 
Connor himself came to claim us in the tunnels. He found Tobias and Rodin first, and then they walked downstairs through the tunnels to find us. Connor offered me a hand from where I still sat on the floor, numb. I'd never killed before, not even accidentally or for defense or for whatever label they would attach to it tonight. My only intention had been to stop him from harming Imogen, and without alerting anyone else in the house to my presence. That at least had been accomplished, but it had come at a heavy price. And as hard as I tried to avoid the comparison, in that moment, I had seen myself as Cregan, sending a deadly arrow into Latimer's chest, all to protect Connor's unholy plan. Every feeling within me was pain, so I hollowed it out and barely acknowledged Connor's greeting when he saw me. I took his hand, but he did more work in pulling me up than I did with any effort to lift myself. I could tell from there that the imitation of Prince Jaren's sword was gone. Mott must have taken it with him when he went to get bandaged. Connor led us into the bedroom, where I sat on my bed. Rodin sat next to me. Tobias took a stool for himself, and Imogen stood, keeping herself apart from the rest of us. Mott was already in the room when we entered. His arm was bandaged and his face was grim. It was obvious where the floor had been scrubbed of blood. Connor addressed Imogen first. May I assume that you were in the tunnels because you were somehow involved in the death of that man? Imogen nodded, slowly. It was my fault, I said. I thought I struck him low enough to avoid any major damage. It was for good reason, Mott said. We all know what would have happened if you hadn't acted, not only to Imogen, but to you boys as well. I knew, yet even that was not enough to make me feel better. But why were you out of the tunnels in the first place? Connor asked. You so easily might have been found. Imogen drew in a breath and opened her mouth. She would speak to take the blame, but reveal the one secret that had protected her ever since coming to Farthenwood. Cutting her off, I withdrew Tobias's papers. These were left in this room, and if found, would have been damaging evidence about us. Mott took the papers and handed them to Connor. He opened them, read a little, then said, You wrote these, Tobias? Yes, sir. His voice trembled when he spoke, and I wondered what was in them. You are a thorough record keeper, more fit to be a king's scribe than a king, I think. Tobias lowered his eyes. Yes, sir. Then Connor turned to me, his expression different from before. Was it respect? Gratitude? I'd so rarely been looked at in any favorable way, I couldn't recognize it. He said, If these papers had been found, none of us would be here tonight. Feldergrath's men were exceptionally thorough, but Mott was able to cover up your presence through his own brave act. Veldergrath left here embarrassed and disgusted when his most tedious search turned up no evidence of either you or that emerald box. But he was right, I mumbled. You are plotting a false ascension to the throne, and you did steal that box from King Eckbert. Neither of which I make any apologies for, Connor's expression cooled. Do you want the throne, Sage? Do you want me to choose you? It wasn't in me to care how I answered. I accept the throne if the alternative is for Veldegraff to take it. My voice sounded as tired as I felt. That's not the same thing. Tell me that you will be a good and noble king, that you want to claim the hand of the betrothed princess, and that you are glad I've done this for you. Lie if you must, but tell me that you want it. I stared at him with a blank expression. Aren't you tired of lies? I am. Connor sighed heavily. I would choose you, Sage, but for that. There is one thing that you must never tire of, not for the rest of your life, and that is the lie. The person I choose must have the lie so settled in his heart that he truly believes he is king, that he ceases to think of his own name and answers only to Jaren's. He must become so convinced of his lies that, were his own mother to appear at his side and call to him, without shedding a single tear, he would tell her he is sorry she's lost her son. But he is the child of Eckbert and Aaron. The person I choose must recall memories of a royal upbringing that never happened. 
and he must do all these things every day for the rest of his life, never once regretting the lie that brought him there. I barely heard him and only stared at the scrubbed area on the floor. Imogen caught my eye and offered a grateful and sympathetic smile. At least she was safe. Connor turned to Rodin. Can you tell the lie, Rodin, for the rest of your life? He sat up straighter. I can, sir. Connor motioned to Imogen. Bring the boys a supper here in their room. Each of you get a good night's sleep because morning will come early. Rodin, you are my prince. You and I depart for Driliad after breakfast. 39. Once I'm named as king, I'll ask Connor not to kill either of you, Rodin said as we lay on our beds that night. Maybe I can get him to exile you to another country or something and make you promise not to return. By the time you've had the chance to talk with him, Cregan will already have carried out his orders, Tobias said. He'll be quick with me, but what about Sage? He'd be anything but quick with me. Cregan had made that clear. I arose from my bed and pressed open the secret door. Where are you going? Rodin asked. If you're running away, let me come, Tobias said. I'm not running away, and it's none of your business where I'm going, I snapped. But I won't lie here while we all talk about our deaths. Rodin was still awake when I came back sometime later. He was sitting up in bed, staring forward but seeing little. Why didn't you run? He asked. His tone was flat and lifeless. You had your chance. I pulled off my boots and sat on my bed. My fingers found a garland in my pocket, which I ran over my knuckles. You think Connor's going to have Tobias and me killed in the morning? Softly, Rodin said. It's not personal, Sage, but I've decided not to ask him to save you too. Not a big surprise, but I still asked him why. Finally, he looked at me. Deep creases lined his forehead. You know my answer. You and Tobias are threats to me now. There's only one way to guarantee you'll never come back to expose me. We're also the only protection you have from Connor. Rodin finger combed his hair off his face, then leaned against the wall. I'll have to deal with that eventually. But until then, I've got to do what's in my own best interest, and Carthia's best interest. I hope you two will forgive me. I flipped the garland at him before I lay on my bed. There's your alm of forgiveness, Rodin. Pay it to the gods or devils, or to Connor, whatever altar you bow to. But don't ask it from me. Errol and the other two servants awoke us shortly before dawn. It was clear as we looked at one another that none of us had slept well. But the bags under Rodin's eyes were so dark, I wondered if he'd slept at all. Particular care was taken with Rodin's bath and dressing that morning, requiring all three servants to help. Tobias and I were left mostly to ourselves, other than Errol briefly slipping away from Rodin's care to check my back. In another day or two, you can remove those bandages, he said. I'll be as healthy as any other dead man, I said lightly. Errol frowned and lowered his eyes. Obviously, he didn't think my impending death was very funny. Once we were ready, Errol pronounced me as similar to Prince Jaron in appearance as he'd seen the night before, but then loudly told Rodin that he also had many features that reminded him of the prince. Looking at Rodin, I hoped he planned on eating only a little. He didn't appear to be in a state to handle a full stomach. Mott came to collect Rodin for breakfast. You understand that the master may wish to reserve some conversations for himself and the prince alone, he said to Tobias and me. Your breakfast will be served in here, and I will come for you later to say your goodbyes. We're tired of eating in here, I complained, but Mott only frowned at me as he led Rodin out of the room. When the door shut, Tobias went to the window. You can get us out of here, right? It's time to run. Run to where? I asked. Where would you go? You could take us back to Avenia. We could hide there. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the garland that I tossed to Rodin last night. It had been left on the floor beside his bed. A day ago, he wouldn't have been so casual about leaving behind any amount of money. But he was Connor's prince now. Money was the least of his concerns. I picked up the garland, 
rolled it over my knuckles, then deposited it in my pocket. Tobias had retreated to his bed, defeated. I sat beside him and said, We're not running away, and this isn't over yet. When I said I wouldn't let Connor kill you, I meant it. Tobias gave a half-hearted smile. Thanks for that, Sage. But at this point, you should start worrying about your own neck. Breakfast arrived soon after. I was as hungry as always, but Tobias barely ate a bite. Mott returned for us before I'd gotten too far into his meal. What's going to happen to Sage and me now? Tobias asked. The master has given no orders, Mott said. Maybe not to you, I said. Where's Cregan? Mott's face darkened. Why didn't you tell Connor you'd lie for him, Sage? He stood right here and said he'd make you his prince. All you had to do was say you would lie. I set my jaw forward, but said nothing. Even if I were inclined to explain myself, which I wasn't, I had no answer to give him. Finally, Mott waved us to our feet. It's too late to go back now anyway. Come with me and bid the prince and the master farewell. We followed him into the entrance hall. Rodin looked pale and terrified. I leaned against the wall and withdrew the garland from my pocket and began rolling it over my knuckles. It was a nervous habit, and I admit that I felt a little nervous. Tobias tried a different tactic. He fell on his knees before Connor, begging mercy. Please don't have us killed, he said. Please, sir, give me your word that we can leave here safely. You ask for the word of a liar? I asked. Would you feel any better if Connor did promise us our lives? Tobias shrank even lower, but Connor stared at me, frozen. What is that trick you're doing? He asked. The knuckle roll came so automatically to me that it barely required my attention. Sir? Connor's hand flew to his mouth. How can I have been so foolish? The devils must be laughing, for I nearly ruined everything. 40. Rodin opened his mouth to speak, but Connor hushed him and walked over to me, never taking his eyes off the coin in my hand. Where did you learn to do that? I shrugged. Any pickpocket can do it. To demonstrate, I dropped the coin in Connor's coat pocket. With my thumb and forefinger, I withdrew the coin, then rolled it over my knuckles and into my palm. It's a good way to steal a coin because you can sneak it away without having to make a fist. Connor turned to Rodin. Can you do it? Rodin shook his head. Tobias also shook his head before he could be asked. I notice you do that with your left hand, Connor said just as you prefer to use a fork or write your letters. Can you do it with your right? I tossed the coin to my right hand and demonstrated the knuckle roll with equal agility. And can you write and eat with the right hand as well? When I was young, my father insisted I learn to use my right hand for everything. He didn't want me to appear different in that way. I was out of practice before, but I've remembered that habit since coming here. Connor walked toward his office. Sage? I will speak with you in private. It was an order, not a request, and I followed him into his office, where he shut the door behind me. You don't have to lie for the rest of your life. There was a desperation in Connor's eyes I'd never seen before. There is another way. Oh? Claim the throne now as Prince Jaron. Be him for a year or two, any respectable length of time. Then assign the throne to anyone you want. You may leave and return to a private life, albeit one of wealth and luxury. What are you asking, sir? I knew, but I wanted to make him say it. Be the Prince Sage. I'm convinced now that it can only be you. What about Rodin? Prince Jaron was famous for his ability to roll a coin over his knuckles. As I've rehearsed this plan in my mind, I anticipated everything the regents might ask in accepting or rejecting you. I considered qualities of his personality and what might remain in his character as he grew and changed. Jaron was trained throughout his childhood in the royal tradition, so my choice would have to display some semblance of that training as well. But until I saw you there... I forgot that this coin roll was an occasional habit of his, a parlor trick, but one few others could do as well. Sooner or later, the regents would expect to see the prince do that. I sat down in one of the chairs and crossed one leg over the other. Rodin can be taught to do it. 
Not in time, and not as well as that. He'd look like he'd just been taught. Sage, you must be the prince. I didn't answer right away, admittedly partially because I knew how desperate Connor was for my response. Finally, I looked back at him. No. Connor exploded. What? Has this all been a game to you? Just a test to see if you could get this far and then reject me? No, sir, but I got to thinking last night while we were in the tunnels. Veldergraf's men would have killed me if they'd found me, right? Somebody did kill the king and queen and Prince Darius. They'll kill me too eventually. I don't want power or wealth, Connor. I want to stay alive. Veldergraf won't dare harm you once you're seated on the throne. If the High Chamberlain, Lord Kerwin, accepts you as Prince Jaren, then Veldegrath will too. As for the royal family, you don't have to worry about the same threat. Why not? They were killed for political reasons. If you use different politics, there will be no motive. My eyes narrowed. How do you know that, Connor? Do you know who killed them? Is that an accusation? He boomed, then lowered his voice, struggling to keep his temper. Regardless of who killed them, I know who their enemies were, and they're no threat to you. I can guarantee your safety on the throne, Sage, and I'll guarantee your death here if you refuse me. You won't kill me, I said. I'm the only hope for your plan to succeed. Let's not pretend otherwise. Connor sat in the other chair facing his desk, his eyes pleading with me to accept his offer. Sage, no harm will come to you upon that throne and you can reign only for as long as you want to. Then I can hand the throne over to you. Connor's face reddened and he stood, yelling again. Hand the throne to anyone you choose. Just make it to someone you trust. I am not a villain in this story, no matter how many times you've attempted to frame me that way. Are you a hero, then? I'm just a man trying to do what I think is best for my country. If I've made mistakes along the way, they were made out of a desire to do the right thing. I have terms, I said. You're insufferable, Connor said. Have you waited for this moment since we met? To force me into a situation where I must give in to your whims, or else see everything I've worked for all this time go to waste? Tobias and Rodin must accompany us to the castle. Why? I promised that if you chose me, I wouldn't allow you to kill them. It's the only way I'll be able to keep that promise. It's a foolish idea. They're a threat to you now. If you had left with Rodin just now, Tobias and I were going to be killed, correct? Connor waved a hand in the air. I can't deny that, nor will I apologize for it. The two boys not chosen know everything. They can use that knowledge to blackmail you, harass you, and intimidate you for the rest of your life. Information is a dangerous thing in the wrong hands, Sage. As of this moment, they are the greatest threat to you. But I will decide how to manage that threat. There's more. Imogen will come to Drilliad as well. Fool boy! May I remind you of the betrothed Princess Amarinda? Imogen has no future connected with you. Once I'm made prince, I'll pay off her debt to you, then set her free. Either all of them come with us, or I don't. Connor cursed, then grabbed a small marble statue off his desk and threw it at me. It whisked past my shoulder, hit the far wall of his office, and cracked the wood paneling. He probably intended to miss, but maybe not. You are not the king yet, he growled. I'll bring them with us only to get your stubborn head into the carriage with me. But until you are crowned, I am the master, and if I see a need to dispose of them, I will. Fair enough, I said. Then a mischievous grin snuck onto my face. So, do you want to bow to me now, or wait until we reach Drilliad? Connor brushed past me and into the entrance hall. He shouted orders for a carriage to be prepared for seven travelers. Cregan would now be our driver. Hail his majesty the scourge of my life, Connor said to Rodin and Tobias as he stomped up the stairs. I fear the devils no longer, because I have the worst of them right here in my home. 41.
Since Connor's traveling group had now swelled from only himself, Mott, and Rodin to a group of seven, we were informed that there would be a delay before we could be ready to leave. Tobias looked pleased and relieved, but Rodin's expression was almost murderous as he stomped away. I wasn't sure where he was going, but knew he'd return when it was time to leave. He couldn't risk being left behind. After changing into riding clothes upstairs, I told Mott that I wanted to go for a ride. This may be my last chance to be truly alone, perhaps ever, I explained. Let me have that time with my thoughts. Mott gave a permissive bow of his head. Be careful, you're Connor's prize now. I'm never careful, I said grinning. Mott didn't smile back. I walked past the kitchen toward the back door of Farthenwood that would lead me to the stables, and was only barely outside before someone punched me in the arm. Not a hard punch, compared to most hits I've taken, but an angry one. Imogen had been standing just outside the door. She'd probably seen me in riding clothes and came out to wait for me. What was that for? I asked, rubbing my arm. She glanced around to make sure we were alone, then hissed. How dare you, Sage? How dare you interfere with my life? Genuinely confused, I took her by the elbow and led her farther away from the door, beside a tall hedge where we would not be easily seen. What are you talking about? I asked. What have I done? You're the prince now? Looks that way. Tears welled in her eyes, though she was obviously trying hard to push them back. And you're bringing me to Drilliad with you. I can get you away from here, from whoever treats you so badly. And then what, Sage? What happens to me in Drilliad? I shrugged, unable to understand why she was so angry. You go free. Once I'm made prince, I'll have access to the treasury. I'll pay off your mother's debt to Connor and you're free. She shook her head stiffly. I won't have your charity. Not from an orphan and certainly not from a prince. It's not charity. You're my friend and I want to help. If possible, that made her even angrier. Do you think this is helpful? I had a place here, Sage. I understood my life. You have no life here. I'm giving it back to you. No, you're not. I know what this is. I folded my arms as I faced her. Oh? You're afraid to go to Drilliad, correct? A little anxious, perhaps, but that didn't explain her anger. What if I am? I replied. You don't understand what... I understand perfectly. You played Connor's game and won. But now that his decision is made, you're afraid no one will believe the lies. You want help in convincing the court. You think by bringing me to Drilliad, I'll feel obligated to lie for you. Strong emotions rose in me. Not exactly anger, though that's how it sounded when I spoke. You think that's my plan? That I'd use you in such a way? I had no idea I was such a horrible person. Her face softened somewhat. You're not horrible, Sage. But look at what Connor's turning you into. Don't you see it? I've watched you go from this orphan boy who might have become my friend to Connor's prince, who will never be anything but his costumed servant. I'm nobody's servant. Yes, you are. She shook her head sadly. You gave in to him. You let Connor win. I didn't think you would. Imogen, there is so much more happening than you know. And does any of it matter more than your freedom? After a slight hesitation, she added, I'm disappointed in you. I'd rather you had run. That would be better than this. Run? Truly angry now, I started to walk away. Then turned back to her. Then you'd condemn Tobias to death, make Rodin a puppet king, and doom yourself to a life here. Connor's held you down for so long, you've forgotten what it's like to breathe free air, and you've given your life to his control forever. You'll never breathe free again. I started to answer, to say whatever was necessary to make her understand. But in the end, I hesitated too long and finally only managed to suggest she should pack her things before Connor was ready to leave. She shook her head, then hurried back into the house. As much as I wanted to follow her, gut instinct told me that would only make things worse. She could believe whatever she wanted about me, but she was still coming to Drilliad.
There were a few stable boys tending to the horses when I arrived there a few minutes later. No sign of Creakin, who was probably now having to get ready for our journey. The longer I avoided him, the better. Cregan had wanted Rodin to be chosen. He'd be furious with me for winning out at the last minute. I chose a quarter horse named Poco for the ride. The stable boy seemed reluctant to let me have it without direct orders from Connor, so I began preparing the saddle myself. Finally, he said he'd do it before I ruined my clothes and got us both in trouble. Riding Poco through the open field was refreshing. I'd found spots of time alone over the past two weeks, but nothing of freedom. Poco was an excellent horse, instinctively obedient and eager to be tested. It wasn't long before Farthenwood was lost behind a wooded hill, and all was silent except for the gentle river nearby with birds chirping overhead. A slight breeze rustled the leaves of the tall trees over my head. I lifted my face to the sky and let the wind and the sun caress my skin. This was freedom, as much as I'd ever know again anyway. If Imogen had been right about anything she accused me of back at the house, this was it. I slid off Poco's back and walked him to the edge of the river. This wasn't far from where Windstorm had left me several days ago, and the memory forced a smile to my face. I wished for a friend or a father I could tell the story to and make them laugh, either with me or at me. I didn't care. Several smooth rocks lay along the bank of the river. I grabbed a fistful and flung them one by one into the water, watching them skip a time or two before disappearing. One rock I kept for myself. It was little surprise only a few minutes later when another horse snorted in the background. Mott had come, no doubt. I'd seen him watching me from a distance when I was in the stables. And by the time I reached the arch of the eastern hill, Mott was in the stables. It must have killed him to wait this long before finally approaching me. Do you mind a little company? He asked. Yes. It didn't matter. He dismounted and walked over to me. We stood side by side for a long while watching the river. Eventually, Maud asked, Did you know he'd pick you because of that trick you can do with the coin? I don't think anyone can predict what Connor will do. It's what makes him so dangerous. But you must have guessed it, or else you would have escaped this morning. Using the passages, it would have been an easy thing to run. Look what happened to Latimer when he tried to run. That brought on an uncomfortable silence. Finally, Mott said, Connor wants you to know that we're ready to leave soon. Errol is waiting to help you change into traveling clothes. You'd think they'd make traveling clothes more comfortable, I muttered. I believe when I'm king, my first order will be to let everyone wear whatever clothes they want. Mott chuckled. Fashion, what a mighty beginning that will be for your reign. After another pause, he added, What kind of king will you be, Sage? Tyrannical and fierce, like Veldegrath would be? Complacent and indifferent, like your father? I turned to him. Like Eckbert, you mean? Of course. With a cough, Maud added. Get used to it. If you are Jaren, then Eckbert is your father. I let that pass. If I'm the prince, then you have a higher loyalty to me than to Connor, correct? Yes. Then tell me this. Did Connor kill my family? I can't answer that, Sage. Can't or won't. You haven't been declared the prince yet. I held out my arms to Mott. Who do you see now, Sage or Jaren? Mott studied me for a long time before answering. The bigger question may be, who do you see? I don't know. It's not easy to be one type of person when you've worked so hard to be a very different type of person. Mott's reply came so fast I wondered if he'd been waiting for just that type of opening. And tell me, Sage, which person have you worked so hard to be, the orphan or the prince? He walked to his horse and untied a bundle on its back, unwrapping it as he carried it to me. Then he set the imitation of Prince Jaren's sword in my hands. My thumb rubbed over the rubies in the pommel. Thinking of how much you could get for them at market? Mott asked. No. I held the sword out to him. I don't understand. I thought you must want it. You stole it before, didn't you? He didn't wait for an answer. We both knew the truth. 
which means you must have controlled that foul mare Cregan gave you long enough to get to and from the sword arena without being seen. I wouldn't say I ever controlled her, I admitted with a grin. I was so worn out at the end she really did dump me into the river. Mott smiled and tapped the sword. I figured you must want it back now, before we leave for Drilliad. Are you giving it to me? Is it mine now? Mott nodded. Without giving it a second glance, I hurled it into the deepest bend of the river. Mott started forward, as if to rescue it, then turned back to me. What did you do that for? I arched my head to look at him. The Prince of Carthia will never wear a cheap copy of his sword at his side. That sword is an insult to him. Is that why you stole it? He didn't wait for an answer, which was good because I couldn't admit that aloud. It would have helped you look more authentic. Do you really think I needed that Mott to help me? Mott nodded very slowly, not in response to my question, but as if he had finally settled something in his mind. No, you will not need that sword, your highness. Then you think I can convince them that I'm the prince? After a deep breath, Mott lowered himself to one knee and bowed his head. What I think, if you forgive me of my blindness before is that I never was looking at Sage the Orphan. I kneel before the living Prince of Carthia. You are Prince Jaren. Forty-two. Jaren Artolius Ekbert III of Carthia was the second son of Ekbert and Aaron, king and queen of Carthia. All of the regents agreed it would have been better if this child had been a daughter rather than a son. A daughter could have married into the kingdom of Galen as a measure of preserving peace. Nor was the young prince particularly impressive as a royal. He was smaller in stature than his brother had been, had a talent for causing trouble, and appeared to favor his left hand, a quality frowned upon for Carthian royalty. Privately, Aaron cherished her second son. The older child, Darius, was already being trained as a future king. He had belonged to the state from the moment of his birth, and fit the role well. He was decisive, controlled, and detached, at least to his mother. But less was expected of Jaren, and he could always be a little bit more hers. Aaron never had felt comfortable as Queen of Carthia. It required her to hide much of her true spirit and zest for adventure. Indeed, Engaging in a secret romance with young Eckbert had been the greatest adventure in her youth. She hadn't paused to consider the consequences until it was too late, and she was in love. Aaron had served drinks in a small tavern at Perth for a year, working off the debts her father had acquired after becoming seriously ill while at sea. It was humiliating work. Until then, their family had enjoyed a fair social status and she had enough education to know how far they had sunk. But Aaron endured it, and eventually the tavern began to prosper under her guidance. Eckbert spotted her one night when he and his attendants traveled through Perth. He returned the second night in disguise, enchanted by her beauty, charm, and loyalty to her family. By the third night, Aaron had figured out who Eckbert really was. He begged her to keep his secret only so that he could continue to see her again. At the end of a week, Eckbert paid off her father's debts, with extra to the tavern owner on a royal command that he must never reveal Aaron's humble origins. He brought Aaron back with him to Drilliad, and made her his queen. In marriage, Eckbert and Aaron were happy, but as king and queen they disagreed on how to rule Carthia. Aaron saw enemies in the faces of those Eckbert sought to appease with favorable trade laws and by ignoring clear violations of treaties. Their older son, Darius, would one day have to bear the consequences of Eckbert's fear of conflict. Jaren would be given more freedom to pursue his own desires. And Aaron loved him for that. Jaren was still very young when it became clear that he was his mother's child more than his father's. The fire he set in the throne room was not malicious. He had taken a bet from a friend, a castle page, that tapestries could burn. He intended to prove it by burning only a hidden corner of the tapestry. 
Over 300 years of threaded history went up in flames before servants were able to put the fire out. Commoners also loved the story of Jaren, at age 10, challenging the king of Mendenwall to a duel. None of them knew that Jaren had overheard the king accuse Queen Aaron of not being a true royal. They only laughed at the image of a ten-year-old boy facing off with a king four times his age. The Mendenwall king humorously obliged Jaren and undoubtedly restrained himself during the duel. Although the king easily won the match, Jaren satisfied himself that he did give the king a nasty cut on the thigh. And he practiced his sword fighting twice as hard from then on. As Jaren grew, Eckbert became increasingly angry and embarrassed by his son's antics. Instead of compressing himself into a model royal, as his father wished, Jaren rebelled further. He snuck out of his bedroom window at night, as often as the weather permitted, and on too many occasions when the bad weather should have discouraged him. Heights never bothered Jaren, not even after the time he fell more than ten feet from a tower and had his life saved by an acroterion at the edge of the gable. He learned to scale the exterior rock walls with his bare hands and feet. Few people ever knew of that, because the only person to ever catch Jaren was his older brother. Jaren never understood why Darius kept his many offenses quiet, perhaps because Darius knew he'd one day be king and hoped Jaren wouldn't embarrass him as well. Or because Darius wanted to spare his father the rumors that would swell throughout Carthia and abroad over how a king who couldn't control his own son could possibly control a kingdom. It never occurred to Jaren that Darius loved him, protected him, so that he could have the life Darius never could. In fact, Jaren never fully understood that anyone in his family, other than his mother, truly loved him. Until it was too late, and they were all dead. Shortly before his eleventh birthday, Jaren's parents called him for a private council. Both Galen and Davinia pressed at Carthia's borders, threatening war. The regents were in an uproar, threatening to depose Eckbert if he didn't push their enemies back. Jaren was a distraction for the country, and something had to be done. Eckbert had found a school up north in the country of Bymar for Jaren to attend. It would give him an excellent education and teach him proper decorum for a prince. Jaren angrily protested. He swore to his father that if he tried to send him to Bymar, he would run away and never be found again. Eckbert retaliated, telling Jaren that if he did not go, it could mean the end for Carthia. He had to prove to both his own country and to the enemies at his border that he could be decisive. He would send his own son away and end the embarrassment. Aaron pled with Jaren to accept Eckbert's decision, to do it for Carthia, to do it for her. I will do it for you, mother, Jaren had said. I'll leave you for your own sake, but you will never see me again. He hadn't meant those words. He was angry and felt horrible even as the threat tumbled from his mouth. But he also hurt in a way he couldn't describe. Enemies weren't at Carthian borders because of him. They were there because his father had looked the other way for too long. Perhaps there were Carthians who laughed at the prince's latest antics, but they would stand by their king when he called them. Jaren left the very next day, rather quietly. There was no farewell supper, no grand entourage to accompany him to the docks at Issel. Only a few officers would journey with him to Avenia. Then across the Arenbol Sea to the gates of Bymar, Jaren got on board the ship and immediately complained of rolling seasickness, despite the fact that the ship had not even left the harbor. A calming medicine was offered to him, and it was recommended that Jaren go to his room below decks to rest. Jaren never took the medicine, and it was no easy matter for him to slip out the small porthole of his room. Still, he had a smaller build than most ten-year-old boys, and after he worked his shoulders free, the rest was simple. Unaware that Jaren had left, the ship set sail without him. The ship was attacked by pirates late that afternoon. When news of the piracy returned to Carthia, a search was made for any survivors. There were none, all of them killed in fighting the pirates or drowned at sea. Because Jaren's body was never found, 
a search was made throughout Avenia and Carthia for any hope of his survival. Before long, most people believed he had joined dozens of others in the ship at the bottom of the sea. Safely on land, Jaron quickly found he had skills that enabled him to blend in with the Venians. He was good with accents, and had studied enough of foreign cultures to move amongst them like a native. He pickpocketed for spare coins or worked odd jobs wherever he found them. Still, he went hungry most days and spent his nights huddled in the shadows, hoping to go unnoticed by the street thugs who patrolled the darkness. It was Darius who found Jaron first. Jaron had dropped a coin in an offerings dish at a church. The priest there recognized the young prince and sent word to Darius, who was known to be searching for his brother in a nearby town. To stall for time, the priest kindly told Jaron he had some extra food, and if Jaron agreed to wash the church steps, he could stay the night. Darius arrived early the next morning, alone. Over a small breakfast with Jaron, Darius described the suffering of their parents, who had tortured themselves over having lost their son. Jaron dissolved into tears and said he would gladly return home if his parents would allow him to come. Darius told him to stay at the church and he would ask their father what should be done. Darius left Jaron in his room, thanked the priest for his services, but informed him that, sadly, the young boy was not the lost prince of Carthia. However, he expressed his pity for the boy and paid the priest to continue to watch over him for another week. One week later, Jaron would finally begin to understand his role in the future of Carthia. 43. At the end of the week, a man came to meet with Jaron in the church. If anyone had asked, the priest would have said he did not know who the man was, only that he had the air of someone of great importance. But nobody asked. As far as they knew, the boy living in the church was an orphan. Jaron recognized his father immediately, despite his extravagant attempts at disguise. They did not embrace. It was not his father's way. But there were tears in his father's eyes, and for the first time, Jaron saw his father as a man, not as a king. They sat in the center of the pews and received little attention from the few patrons who had come that day. It was awkward at first, for although they sat close together, father and son had grown miles apart. When I was your age, I wanted to be a musician, Eckbert said. It was a poor attempt at connecting with his son, but it was all he had. Did you know that? Jaron nodded. His mother had told him that once. And when he was very young, his father would occasionally show him how to play some of his favorite instruments, although he was careful never to do so when there were servants around. His father thought it would be an embarrassment. Eckbert smiled at the memories of his own youth. I enjoyed playing the fippler, and although I confess I wasn't very good, it brought me a lot of joy. Do you remember when you were younger? I taught you a song or two, I believe. I remember one of them, Jaron whispered, mother's favorite. Eckbert folded his arms together and leaned against the bench of the church. My father, your grandfather, couldn't tolerate the squeaks and pitches of my music and discouraged me from playing. He said music was a useless education for a future king and a waste of my time. Although I didn't understand it then, he was right. Jaron listened quietly. It was hard to picture his father as ever having been a boy, as ever having any desire unconnected with the throne. You and I are not so different as you might think, Jaron. I spent much of my own childhood wishing I could have been someone other than a crown prince. I'm not a crown prince, Jaron reminded him. Just a prince. Darius will take the throne. As he should, and he'll be a fine king one day. But what about you? What do you want for your life? Being a prince doesn't seem to suit you. His father had intended to mean that Jaron was capable of anything, even beyond the castle walls. Jaron took it that his father felt he was unfit for his title and offered nothing more than a shrug in response. How has your life as a commoner been these past weeks? Eckbert asked. I've managed. I knew you would. 
and I know you can. Jaron glanced up at his father with questioning eyes. What did he mean by that? Eckbert sighed. Still, there will be hard lessons. If you are not Jaron, then you are nobody to the world. They will not care if you go hungry, if you are cold, if you lie beaten on the streets. I'll do the best I can for you, and beg your forgiveness that I can't do more. I want to come home, Jaron said softly. It was difficult for him to admit, but whether he was good enough to be a prince or not, he couldn't take another day on his own. His mother would want him back. Probably Darius, too. He wasn't sure about his father. You cannot come back, came his father's solemn answer. Jaron set his jaw forward, the way he often did when he fought against his anger. This is my punishment for running away? To be disowned? You're not disowned. And it's not a punishment. It's what your country demands of you now. Jaron rolled his eyes. His father couldn't shove the blame away from himself so easily. I'm to become a commoner then? Shall I call you King Eckbert? Or forget your name entirely? That hurt his father. But Jaron hurt too. So he felt justified in his words. You are always my son, Eckbert answered. But the situation with the pirates has changed everything. Everyone believes you are dead, and I cannot allow that belief to change. They were silent for several seconds. Finally, Jaren spoke. If I came home, would you declare war on Avenia for sinking that ship? Eckbert sighed heavily. I would have to, because you could provide the proof that it was Avenian pirates who attacked a ship with a royal on board. If I start a war with Avenia... Galen will almost certainly align with them, and we shall be nearly surrounded by enemies. Carthia could not survive that war. And if I remain missing, would you have to declare war? If you remain missing, I can tell my people that I will not declare war until there is proof of your death. Then we both know what has to happen. Jaron had said it matter-of-factly. He had considered this possibility but hoped against it. What about Darius and mother? Darius misses you, but he knows there are sacrifices we make for the good of Carthia. Your mother doesn't know you've been found. Obviously, she would want you to come home to her, but she doesn't see the enemies that surround us. Not like I do. We've always had enemies at our borders, but not all at the same time. Since you've been missing... They have backed off our borders, royal courtesy in our time of mourning for you. But the news is worse. I have enemies within Carthia, within my own castle. There are regents who look at my throne with greedy eyes. If I declare war and vengeance for you, they may not support me. They are the ones I fear. Do you think they're a danger to you? Eckbert forced a smile onto his face. Regents are always the greatest threat to a king, but I have Darius. If they get to me, the royal line must continue, or else Carthia will destroy itself in civil war. That's Darius's duty, Jaron. Do you understand yours? He understood it far too well for a boy of only ten years. Mine is to remain missing, to not come back. Do you understand that you cannot reveal your true identity out here? You must change everything about yourself that you can. Lighten your hair with some dyes, and grow it out to alter the look of your face. I'm told you speak with an Avenian accent. Keep that. I can use my left hand, Jaron offered. I always preferred it anyway. And rid yourself of anything you might have learned in the castle. Of learning, of culture, of skills. There is an orphanage in Karchar. Not far from here, but back within Carthia's borders. It's run by a woman whose reputation is good, Mrs. Turbledy. Now you must understand that I cannot have payment made to her for your care. You go there as an orphan, without any advantage over the others. It will be a hard few years until you're of age, and can live on your own. Tears stung Jaron's eyes, but he pushed them away. He wouldn't give his father the satisfaction of seeing his pain. If Eckbert noticed his son's breaking heart, 
he didn't acknowledge it. He gave Jaron a handful of silver coins. Come up with a story to get yourself into the orphanage. Say you stole these or whatever excuse you'd like, but they will buy your way through the front doors. I can fake an illness when the coins run out, Jaron said. Let her think she's got the truth from me. Eckbert smiled. You used that trick often enough on your tutors. What an irony that it may keep you alive now. There's always the possibility of Mrs. Turbledy trying to sell you into servitude, but I don't think she'd find any buyers. No, Jaron agreed. I'm too difficult for anyone to want me. Exactly, his father said. The full meaning of Jaron's words probably didn't occur to him, which almost made it hurt worse. Eckbert untied a small satchel at his waist, which he pressed into Jaron's hand. I have a gift in there for you. The best of anything I could offer. There is a letter instructing you on how to use it. Jaron looked in the satchel, then closed it up again. It meant nothing to him. When Eckbert stood to leave, Jaron placed a hand over his father's arm and whispered, Stay a little longer. If I do, the priest will grow suspicious, Eckbert said. This is real, then? Sharon's heart pounded, though he couldn't tell whether it was from sadness or fear for his future. When you leave, I'm no longer Prince Jaron. I'll be nothing but a commoner, an orphan. You will always be a royal in your heart, Eckbert said tenderly. There may come a time when you must be Prince Jaron again for your country. You will know if it does come. Am I alone? Eckbert shook his head. I will come in disguise on the last day of every month to the church nearest Mrs. Turbledy's orphanage. If you ever need to see me, I'll be there. Then he left. And from that moment on, I became Sage of Avenia, orphan son of a failed musician and a barmaid, who knew little of the king and queen of Carthia, and cared even less. Completely alone. The False Prince, Disc 6 44. My head snapped up as our carriage bumped over a rock in the road. Connor, sitting in the seat directly opposite me, watched me with obvious disgust. I knew he hated having to choose me as his prince, but Tobias, who was asleep on my right, was a complete failure. And Rodin, sitting up straight on my left, could not convince the regents. Imogen was on Connor's left. She stared straight ahead refusing to acknowledge that she saw anything at all. Mott sat on Connor's right and nodded slightly at me when I looked at him. There had been no point in lying any further to Mott. Back at the river, he hadn't asked whether I was the prince. He knew it, and he knew by my reaction that he was correct. Undoubtedly, he had a hundred questions to ask, and there were so many things I wanted to tell him just to have somebody to speak openly to. But Connor was anxious for us to leave, and there was no time. All I had asked of Mott was that he keep our secret to himself. Judging by Connor's sour expression, he had obeyed. I leaned back and closed my eyes again, not to sleep, but to be alone with my thoughts. After four years of pretending, of immersing myself so completely in Sage's identity, could I emerge convincingly as Jaron? Connor's regimen of lessons in the past week actually had been helpful. I'd forgotten the names of several court officials, and even a few of my ancestors that a prince would be expected to know. As a boy, I had been well trained in both sword fighting and horseback riding, both which were as instinctive to me now as breathing. Although I had practiced whenever possible in the orphanage, those skills had softened over the past four years, and it was good to build them up again. Even though I was pretending to sleep, I couldn't help but smile at the memory of Cregan's anger when I challenged him to his wildest horse. The horse he'd brought me out from the stables really was beyond my skills to train, and I was barely able to control her enough to steal the fake sword while everyone was distracted elsewhere. Other things had been a waste of time. Obviously, I could read much better than I let on, though to have confessed that would have been disastrous for my disguise. I'd have to apologize later to Tobias for that lie. 
He would have secured his papers more carefully if he had known I read every word on them while he slept at night. Of course, my back still stung from where he'd cut me, and that was a far worse crime. I'd agree to forgive him if he forgave me. There were a lot of things I'd have to ask forgiveness for, and I feared I wouldn't receive half as much of it as I wanted. Not from Imogen, who had trusted me with the greatest secret of her life, that she could speak. I had trusted her with nothing. Not from Amarinda, who pled with a broken heart for any truth about whether Darius, the prince she was betrothed to and loved, was alive, or about the existence of his younger brother, whom she would eventually have to marry if Darius really were dead. And I'd get no forgiveness ever from my mother, who went to her death believing I died in an attack by Avenian pirates, nor from my father. For most of the past four years, I blamed him for keeping me away from the castle. True, I'd accepted his request without argument, but how could I have known then how difficult these recent years would be? He would have known much of what was ahead of me, and still he chose peace for his country over his own son. Maybe it was the right thing to do. I still didn't know for sure. But it didn't diminish my shame that they'd had to send me away in the first place, nor my anger at my father who had his first reunion with me in the church, already had a plan to keep me away. I returned every month to the church near the orphanage to see my father, but I never let him know I was there. We never spoke again. It was only after Connor told me that both my parents and my brother had been killed that I began to understand my father in a new way. He had said that his greatest enemies were the regents. Connor had told me that all three members of the family were intended victims, so that a regent would have to be crowned. While at Farthenwood, I slowly began to understand that as long as four years ago, my father had foreseen the possibility that all of them could be murdered one day. He didn't keep me away to protect himself from embarrassment, nor was it to avoid having to declare war on Avenia. My father kept me away to keep me alive. After pirates had tried to kill me, he must have worried that the rest of his family's lives were in danger. He had told me in the church that day that the royal line must continue to save Carthia, so that if the worst happened and they were all killed, I would remain to claim the throne. He'd even given me a way home. I just never expected to need it. He had let me think the worst of him for over four years, and I'd eagerly done so. For that, I could never have his forgiveness. When Connor first brought me to Farthenwood, I thought he knew that Jaron was alive and he was searching for the prince, hoping to use him for some sort of ransom. So I determined that he must never suspect my true identity. That would have been bad. But Connor's real plan was far worse. He was hoping to fool the entire kingdom with a fraudulent prince. I knew then that the best course of action was to play along with his plan, get him to choose me on my own terms, then return to Driliad to prove my identity. Connor had his plan, and I had mine. Whether either of them would work remained to be seen. Connor kicked my feet to get my attention. We're nearly there, he said. Straighten up, and at least try to look like a prince. Are we going to the castle this late at night? I mumbled, while glancing out the window into the darkness. Of course not. We'll stay at an inn. The choosing ceremony is tomorrow evening. If we're going to the inn, then I go as I am. I slouched back into my seat. The charade of being sage was nearly over. I planned to enjoy it as long as I could. 45. We stopped at a place known simply as the Traveler's Inn. It wasn't far from the castle. Nobles not invited to stay within the castle walls often slept there. I told Connor it was too fancy because they'd only expect people of wealth and influence to stay there. The irony amused me and escaped him. I am a person of wealth and influence, Connor said, irritated. My face is known, so I won't have anyone wonder why I'm staying at a commoner's tavern, and nobody will look at you if you keep your head down. Mott stayed with Rodin, Tobias, Imogen, and me while Connor went inside to reserve three rooms for us. 
I wondered as I stared at Imogen whether she would run away if she had her own room, but then dismissed those thoughts. She had no money to support herself in a strange town, and besides, she would likely consider it dishonorable to run. Why bring us along? Rodin asked me after Connor had left. Will you enjoy having us watch in humiliation as you're declared? He saved our lives, Tobias said. He brought us along to make sure Connor didn't have us killed back at Farthenwood. Tobias is right, Mott said. Cregan told me his orders were to kill the two boys left behind. ...and arched his head. Cregan wouldn't have killed me. He wanted me to become the prince. That isn't Cregan's decision to make, Tobias said. Besides, Mott added, you will understand in time that Connor's decision was the right one. I flashed Mott a glare. That was going too far. He lowered his eyes and said nothing more. What's she here for? Tobias asked, nodding at Imogen. Then he smiled. Oh, you'll use her to convince the princess. Amarinda would never suspect her of lying. Imogen flushed and stared at me with hatred in her eyes. It was nearly the same accusation she had already made to me. After I'm declared, you're all free to go, I said. All I ask is if there are any secrets between us, that you keep them. I don't believe you, Rodin said bitterly. We're too dangerous with all we know, so you'll excuse me if I wait to see whether we walk free before I celebrate your generosity. You're excused, I said, and slumped down again and closed my eyes. That didn't last. Connor returned only seconds later. There are no rooms available in all of Drilliad, he said. It cost me more than three rooms combined to take the reservation of a man who should have arrived by now. Bribing the innkeeper to claim his messenger never arrived to make the reservation was enormously expensive. Only one room? I asked. What about Imogen? She'll sleep out here in the carriage, Connor said. No, we will, I protested. A lady won't be treated that way. She's no lady. Connor said. She's my kitchen maid, whom you are in the process of stealing away for yourself. She won't belong to me any more than she should belong to you right now. She takes the room. A wicked glint sparked in Connor's eyes. He smiled and offered a hand to her. Very well, my dear. Come with me. I swatted his hand away and Mott sat forward, saying, I'll stay in the carriage with Rodin and Tobias to make sure there's enough space in the room. You can give Imogen the second bed and hang a sheet for her privacy. Connor and Sage, you two can share the rest of the room. It was an acceptable compromise. Imogen didn't seem happy about it, but it was the best of her options. She refused either my hand or Connor's to help her out of the carriage and followed Connor and me into the inn. As we walked, I asked Connor why the inn was so full. Keep your head down, he hissed. The rumor of the deaths of the royal family has spread throughout Carthia. Everyone has come to see who the new king will be tomorrow night. Are you still confident in your plan? Less confident than I was, Connor whispered. I didn't anticipate so much competition. You will have to do a very good job tomorrow in convincing them. A grin spread across my face. Don't worry. I will. 46. It wasn't a large room, but it was clean and pleasant and would be enough for the three of us for one night. Two small beds stood along one wall. I helped Connor push Imogen's bed against the opposite wall then quickly offered to sleep on the floor. I'm still an orphan and you're still a noble, I said to Connor. You should have the other bed. Of course I should, and watch your tongue when saying I'm still a noble. I will always be a noble if you hope to remain a prince. My mistake, I said, putting on whatever expression of humility he would expect to see. Imogen and I took a sheet off her bed and hung it from the ceiling. It wasn't a perfect solution for her privacy, but it was the best any of us could hope for. 
She removed one of the blankets from her bed for me to sleep with on the floor. I put myself directly between hers and Connor's beds. He noticed. You think I'd try any mischief with that disgusting girl? I knew her mother who was worthless too. Imogen's safe with me, boy. It's you she should worry about. I let that comment pass. No doubt she was worried about me, but for entirely different reasons. It was very late at night when I heard her roll off her bed onto her feet. Connor's snoring was ferocious, so it was no surprise that he didn't hear her and wake up. She stepped from behind the hanging sheet and touched my shoulder. I sat up and she put a finger to her lips, then motioned for me to follow her. In the chance that Connor did awaken, I positioned my blanket so that in the darkness it would appear someone was here but I learned from more than one time in his presence during the night that he never woke up. Once on Imogen's side of the makeshift curtain, she pointed to the window. Are you too warm? I asked. Can you take me out there? She whispered. Is it safe? I inched the window open, examined the wall in the moonlight, and nodded. In typical Carthian style, a ledge had been built directly below the window. I crawled through the window first, and then helped her through. The night was cool and the breeze had picked up somewhat. But she didn't seem to hate me right now, so it was probably our last chance for any private conversation. We sat on the ledge and leaned against the wall of the inn, letting our legs dangle below. Do you often go out on ledges at night? I asked. You do. I saw you once crawling around the walls of Farthenwood. She shrugged and said, I don't think you saw me watching you, though. I hadn't seen her, which was amazing because I'd always watched carefully for anyone below me on the grounds. I couldn't sleep, she added. All I could think about was the carriage ride. Rodin is so angry with you. Is he? With so much cheerfulness in that ride, I barely noticed. She ignored that. Doesn't he understand why you brought him? What would have happened if you'd left him behind? I was silent. It was nothing new to have someone mad at me. But Rodin's anger bothered me, and I couldn't quite figure out why. Back at Farthenwood, I said horrible things to you, Imogen continued. I don't know why I said them. Maybe I deserved some of it. No, you didn't. I blamed you for my own worries about coming to Drilliad leaving the safety of Farthenwood. But now that I'm gone, I can't imagine returning there. Anything is better than Farthenwood. She lowered her eyes. I'm sorry. I should have trusted you. I deserved no trust. And yet she asked my forgiveness? Could she see me in the darkness and know how her words bit into my heart? Or did I have no heart, no soul, Connor had said we must prepare to sacrifice our very souls to bring Prince Jaron to the throne. I had done just that, although not in the way Connor thought. Are you nervous about tomorrow, Sage? Yes. Even with the truth on my side, there was so much that could go wrong. Don't be. You look so very like him in that painting that they're sure to accept you. I watched you as we rode in the carriage. If I'm not careful, I may begin calling you Jaren myself. Would you? For reasons I couldn't explain, even to myself, I longed to hear someone call me by my real name. I was tired of Sage. There were so many things I disliked about him lately. She hesitated a moment before smiling. Right now? What am I supposed to call you? Jaren or Prince or Your Majesty or what? I shook my head. They all sound so wrong for me. But after tomorrow, there will be no more sage. Only Jaren. Her smile fell. I could see the curve of her mouth by the light of the midnight sky. I won't know, Jaren. Don't make me give up sage yet. There was nothing I could say to that. A wisp of her hair blew in the nighttime breeze. I caught the hair and tucked it behind her ear. She smiled, then reached for a pin and fastened it again, always maintaining her neat servant's braid.
I wondered if she could ever learn to see herself as something other than a servant. Something greater. We should probably go inside. Imogen sat up straight. I can't imagine what would happen if Connor found us out here. We're not doing anything wrong, I said. And I'm not afraid of him. But I am. Will you help me in? I stood, and when my footing was secure, I helped her to stand. But instead of turning to re-enter the window, she faced me. Back at Farthenwood, you told me there were more things happening than I understood. What did you mean by that? I pressed my lips together, then said, I meant that there's a big difference between acting like a prince and being a prince. If you see me after I'm crowned, will you try to talk to me as Jaren? Can you do that? Without answering, she crouched down to the window. Before she returned to the room, she paused and said, You'll become a king tomorrow, the most powerful person in the land. But I'll still be Imogen, a servant girl. After tomorrow, it will no longer be appropriate for me to talk to you. Before I could answer, she disappeared through the window. By the time I climbed through and shut it tightly, she was already back in her bed. Her message was clear. I was a prince now, and she had returned to being Imogen the Mute. 47. Morning came early. I'd barely slept, if at all. One thought after another had tumbled through my mind faster than I could make sense of it. For most of the past four years, I had accepted the idea that I would be sage for the rest of my life. Letting that go and allowing myself to be Jaren again was more difficult than I had anticipated. I was already awake when Connor tried to kick me into consciousness, so his foot hit my hands and nothing worse. Then he called for Imogen to wake up and go downstairs to order us a breakfast. Ours was to be served in our room. Then she could take something to the boys in the carriage. He gave her no instructions on when she could eat. We'll stay here in the room until it's time to leave, Connor said. I've got only hours left to prepare you for presentation. I am prepared, I grumbled. Connor smirked at me. I would have expected more humility from you today. Our highest priority is to rehearse the order of action tonight. And don't try to tell me you know about that. I didn't. Tell me then. Get dressed and straighten this room first, or else the maids will wonder about our arrangement last night. I have a few duties for Ma to attend to this morning that I must speak with him about. By the time I dressed and replaced the hanging sheet and my blanket on Imogen's bed, Connor was returning with Imogen behind him. She carried a tray that she set on a table in our room. I wondered if she had risked speaking to the staff to order our breakfast, or if not how she had communicated our order to them. Maybe it was a good thing you brought her along, Connor said. It's handy to have a traveling servant. I thought that's what Mott is for, I said. He's more than a common servant. Surely you've noticed that by now. Imogen laughed as quickly as she could, and Connor handed me a plate filled with hot cakes, eggs, and thick slices of bacon. It's a large breakfast. I said hungrily. This is nothing compared to what lies ahead for you, Connor said. Once you're the prince, you may tell your servants anything you wish to eat, and they will provide it. They will feed it to you if you desire. I don't. There's no need to tempt me for this position, Connor. You have me. Now tell me about court tonight. All twenty of the king's regents will meet in the throne room at five o'clock. Also, there will be the king's closest advisor, the High Chamberlain, Lord Kerwin. No need for you to know all of their names. Jaron likely would not have known them, so no one will expect you to. I didn't know all of them. There were some I expected to recognize. Kerwin would know me best. He'd suffered through my childhood beside my family. But would he recognize me after all this time? It was doubtful. i changed a lot in four years. Connor continued. The first act of the meeting will be to officially announce the deaths of the King, Queen, and Crown Prince Darius. I winced at that. Connor didn't notice. He never had before either. 
The announcement is merely a formality. Most of the regents have known this from the start, and the others will have heard enough rumors to confirm the likelihood in their minds. Then we'll have a report from the three regents who traveled to Avenia to seek any news as to the life or death of Prince Jaren. They will report a confirmation that he's dead. How do you know? I asked. Because he is dead, Connor snapped. Who do you think hired the pirates so many years ago? The news knocked the wind from my lungs. It overwhelmed any sense of pretense I'd been able to maintain thus far with him. All that kept me from attacking him was the knowledge that I still wanted him with me at the castle tonight. Why? My voice was hoarse. I didn't trust myself to say anything more. I thought it'd force us into war with Avenia. Eckbert stood by and did nothing year after year while Avenia inched its way deeper into Carthian lands. But if Avenian pirates killed his son, he'd be forced to act. Unfortunately, despite the pirates' assurances to me that everyone on that ship went down, Jaren's body was never found. Eckbert was able to appease his critics by saying he wouldn't go to war until he had Jaren's body as evidence in the attack. However, Avenia has backed off since their suspected involvement in Jaren's death. So in a way, my plan worked better than I could have hoped for. Our borders are safer, and no war was needed. Connor paused as if he expected me to say something. What did he want? Congratulations? He seemed to sense my discomfort, then added, I know this secret is safe with you, because you can't reveal it without betraying your own true identity. No, I mumbled. I can't betray my identity. Yet. Connor brushed his hands together as if the matter were settled. So let's continue. When the three regents report that Prince Jaren is dead, this will be the time when, as the High Chamberlain, Lord Kerwin will stand and declare that a new king must be chosen. However, before he stands, I will come forward and announce that the regents are wrong about Jaren's death. That's when I will introduce you to the court. There will be a bit of commotion initially, but Kerwin will have you brought to him. There will be several questions, a careful examination of you. It will take some time. And no matter what they say, you must answer calmly and with confidence. You must keep your sharp tongue under control. And you must not make a single mistake. Can you do it? I can. That pleased Connor. Good. We'll work on your answers through much of today. Make sure you know everything to say. And of course, I'll be there to assist should you get into any trouble. I pushed my plate aside, unable to eat anything else. Connor pushed it back to me. You must have your energy today. I shoved my chair behind me and stood. You said you have proof I can offer them. What is it? Later, Connor said. You don't get that unless I'm certain you are going to be declared prince tonight. You have only a few hours to learn everything else you must. If you've finished eating, are you ready to get started? I closed my eyes and tried to control my breathing. My heart raced at the prospect of all that lay ahead of me that day. No matter what Connor told me or tried to teach, one thing was certain. I was not, nor would I ever be ready. But that wasn't what he wanted to hear. So I looked at him and said, Okay, let's begin. 48 Connor drilled me nonstop for four hours. He refused to answer any knock on the door with more than an order of, Go away! And denied my requests for a break to step outside and clear my head. I didn't care about most of what he told me, but I had to remember it for now, word for word, in order to repeat it back to him. Finally, in the late afternoon, Connor announced I was ready to go before the court. He declared himself an excellent teacher due to the fact that I had learned so much in such a short period of time. Little did he guess how much his student already knew. Yet there were a few things I did not know, things I had been too young to understand when I left there as a child. 
Connor had provided me with details of Jaron's early life with such intimacy that I had asked him how he could know so much. I read the Queen's diaries, he said. She wrote about Jaron often. Did she? It was impossible to sound as if I didn't care what my mother had really thought of me, and the curiosity burned my heart. I knew she loved me, because all mothers love their children, but she had stood with my father when they first sent me away, and I'd never quite gotten over that. Jaron had the reputation for being a difficult child, I said. Did she ever forgive him for that? Connor smiled. Interesting choice of words, Sage, to assume she thought there was anything about Jaron that needed forgiveness. She believed he was just like her. He may have been difficult, but she loved him all the more for it. We had to move on quickly from that conversation. It was too close to me, too hard to think about. Connor also provided me with a convenient story of how I escaped the pirates. According to him, I had seen their ship approaching and escaped in a rescue boat moored to the ship. I had hidden in Avenian orphanages in fear all this time, coming forward only when I heard rumors of the deaths of Eckbert and Aaron. I urged him to change the story a little. Have me hiding at Mrs. Turbaldy's orphanage. That way, if any of them claim to know me, we can acknowledge it was me, but in disguise the entire time. Connor's face brightened. This is why you'll convince them tonight. You have a great gift for thinking fast when necessary. So when Connor announced that I was finally ready, I was not prepared for what happened next. He invited Maud into the room, who was carrying rope in one hand and a length of fabric in the other. Maud's face was pale, and he entered the room barely able to look at me. Are you ill? Connor asked him. No, sir. I just... We can't do this. Then he glanced at Connor with moist eyes, and I understood. Mott shook his head. If you knew, this boy... Do it, I said, turning to Mott. It took all my strength to force the words out knowing what was coming. You're Connor's miserable dog, aren't you? Without warning, Connor grabbed me around the neck where he held me while Mott tied my hands. I noticed he gave me a little slack on my wrists but it didn't matter. Despite the churning inside me, I had to let Connor do what he was going to do. Then Connor released me, and Mott tied a gag in my mouth. He still refused to look at me, but I saw deep creases in the lines of his face. He wasn't any happier about what was going to happen than I was. Remember, Mott, don't leave any marks, Connor said. Mott put a hand on my shoulder, and for the first time looked into my eyes. He squeezed my shoulder gently, his attempt at an apology, then speared his fist into my gut. I stumbled backward and fell onto the floor. It was difficult to draw in a breath, especially with the gag between my teeth, and I barely had time to recover before Mott yanked me to my feet again. He unfastened the top three buttons of my shirt, then walked behind me and hooked his arms through my elbows, pulling my bound hands tightly against me. I grunted from the pain in my shoulders and down my back, but he gave me no room for movement here. Connor withdrew a knife from his sheath and walked up close to me. He put the tip of the blade against my chest and held it there. I know it was Tobias who tried to kill you before, he said, but he couldn't do it because he's weak. A leader needs to be strong, Sage. Do you believe that? I didn't move. All I could focus on was the point of the blade. Of course you do. You killed Veldegraff's man when he tried to attack Imogen. So you can be strong, and I admire that. But you must know when to be strong, and when to give up control. In a very short time you will become the leader of Carthia. Before that happens, I need to make it very clear what the arrangement will be between you and me. No marks, Master Connor, Mott said. Connor glared at Mott, clearly annoyed, but he lightened the pressure of his knife and said to me, You will be king in any decision a king may make. However, from time to time I will have suggestions for you. You will obey them without question or hesitation. If you do not, I will expose you as a traitor to the crown. 
and believe me when I say I can do it with no danger to myself. If you do not obey me when I give the command, then you will be publicly tortured and hanged in the town square for treason. Princess Amarinda, if she is your wife by then, will be expelled from Carthia, to forever live in humiliation. And if you have children, they will die of starvation and shame. Do you believe I can make this happen? I still did not move. Connor's face twisted in rage. He reared back, and with his free hand punched me again in the gut. Mott still braced me from behind, so there was nothing I could do but bite down on the gag and groan in muted pain. He hit me two more times, and once in the chest, and once on my shoulder. Then he ripped me away from Mott and threw me on the floor. He knelt beside me and hissed into my ear. You are nothing other than what I have made you into. I have followed through on my threats to other royals. Attempt to betray me and meet their fate. Do you understand? I nodded, and he lifted me back into a sitting position. He said, In your first act as king, you will remove Veldergrath as a regent. Tell the court you suspect Veldergrath may have something to do with your family's deaths, and you refuse to have him as a sitting regent in the court. Your second act as king will be to install me as your prime regent, I don't care who you replace Veldergrath with, though as your prime regent, I am happy to recommend names if you are unfamiliar with them. Do you agree to this? I nodded again. With his knife, Connor cut the ropes binding my wrists, then sliced through the gag on my mouth. As soon as he did, I spat at him. He wiped the spit off his face, then slapped me hard across my cheek. This would be easier if you accepted that what I want is a better situation for us both. He said, You are the lowest form of life Carthia has to offer, yet I am making you a king. Stop fighting me, Sage, and let us be friends. He seemed disappointed that I gave him no response. Then he stood and said to Mott, Clean him up and get him dressed. I'll have Imogen bring something to eat very soon. Do not leave him alone until I return. Then he wiped his hands, straightened his jacket, and left the room. 49. As soon as Connor left, Mott was by my side, helping me up off the floor and onto the bed. I rolled onto my back and groaned, holding my side. I think he cracked a rib, I said. He punches a lot harder than you do. To be fair, your highness, I was holding back, Mott said. I wanted to laugh, but over the past two weeks, I'd learned how much that could hurt. So I just closed my eyes while Mott unbuttoned the rest of my shirt and felt around for any injuries he might detect. Why didn't you let me tell him the truth? Mott asked. He's going to find out soon enough anyway, and you could have saved yourself all this pain. He'd never have believed it, I said. He should know who I am better than anyone. But all he can see is the boy from the orphanage. That's all he'll ever see of me. Perhaps so, Mott said. Other than a tiny cut on your chest, I can't see any damage. Trust me, there's damage. Couldn't you have stopped him? Only you could have. He began sliding my shirt down my arms. I let him do all the work. What were you thinking by spitting at him at the end, begging for more? I answered with an ow as Mott pushed my left arm back too far. He apologized and moved more carefully. You are the biggest fool of a boy I've ever known, Mott said. Then his tone softened. But you will serve Carthia well. I wish I felt ready to do this, I said. The closer we come to the moment the more I see every defect in my character that caused my parents to send me away in the first place. From all I'm told, the prince they sent away was selfish, mischievous, and destructive. The king who returns is courageous, noble, and strong. And a fool, I added. Mott chuckled. You're that too. Getting dressed in the outfit Connor had planned for me took quite a while. It was fancier than the usual clothes we had at Farthenwood, and immediately reminded me of the one thing I'd never missed of castle life. The tunic was long and black with gold satin ribbon running from my chest to the bottom hem. 
Beneath it I wore a white, full-sleeved shirt that gathered at my wrists and was too tight on my neck. A dark purple cape hung from my shoulders, clasped with a gold chain that was heavier than it looked. Real gold? I asked. Mott nodded and offered me a pair of new leather boots and a ridiculous hat that had a long white feather in it. I took the boots and ignored the hat. I sat in front of a mirror as Mott combed my hair smooth and tied it back with a ribbon. Your cheek is still red from where he slapped you, he said, but it should fade before we reach the castle. I hope it stays. Let it remind Connor of how important he thinks he is to me. I caught Mott's eyes in the mirror. Do I have your loyalty? Mott nodded. You have my life, Prince Jaren. He finished by tucking down the collar of my jacket, then said, What do you think of yourself now? It's as good as I might expect to look. There was a knock at our door. Maud opened it and Imogen walked in with a tray of food. Her eyes were red but dry. I wanted to ask Maud to leave so that I could speak with her, but I knew he had to obey Connor's order to stay. Besides, there was really nothing more I could say to Imogen than had already been said. She would be the greatest casualty in this plan, which was entirely my fault. If it was possible to apologize to her, I didn't know how. She set the tray on the small table in the center of the room. Mott started to tell her to bring the tray over to me directly, but I held up my hand and said I'd come get the food. She must have noticed something different in the pained way I walked, because she furrowed her eyebrows and looked questioningly at me. I smiled in return but I don't think she believed it. Do you want her to leave while you eat? Maud asked. Ignoring Maud, I asked her, Have you eaten yet today? She cast a sideways glance at Maud, but I said, Imogen, it was my question, not his. She slowly shook her head. I uncovered the lid to my tray and found a deep dish meat pie and a thick slice of bread. There's more than enough for both of us. She mouthed the word no to me, but I pretended not to see it and with my spoon dished her out a sizable portion, which I set on the plate where the bread had been. I handed it to her with the spoon and said I'd eat my half after she finished using the utensil. Have you eaten, Mott? I asked. I'd better have, because that meal won't split a third time, Mott said. Once Imogen began eating, she devoured the food as if it were the first she'd eaten in days. She finished her meat pie and then found the napkin and carefully wiped the spoon clean before handing it back to me. Do you want more? I asked. I'm not hungry. She shook her head and stood, backing away from the table with a bowed head. She comes to the castle with us tonight, I told Mott. It's not Connor's plan, Mott began. It's my plan, though. What have Tobias and Rodin been doing all day? Connor heard a rumor last night. He sent them into town to see if they can learn anything. What's the rumor? That there are other princes your... Other princes, Sage. It appears that Connor is not the only one with this plan. Yes, but Connor has an advantage the others don't. Correct. Mott returned my smile. Imogen noticed the exchange between us but of course said nothing. Connor returned to the room just as I was finishing the meal. He ordered Imogen to return the tray and Mott to wait outside. Then he shut the door behind us. He carried two bundles in his arms. You look good, he said. Better than I feel, I responded coolly. Connor looked at me without sympathy. I trust your bruises will keep my words in your memory for a long time. It was safe to say that I would never forget them. Bile rose in my throat every time I thought of his cursed words. I tilted my head at the bundles. What's in them? He began unwrapping the first, smaller bundle. You've seen this before, he said, revealing the emerald-encrusted box. It belonged to Queen Erin. There is something about her that few people knew. Indeed, I did not know it myself until I took this box after her death and saw the contents. He slid a thin bronze key into the lock and opened the box. All I could see were a few folded papers. What are they? He handed them to me. You will put these in your pocket, 
I think we have more than enough to earn your identity, but it's always wise to have a backup. I unfolded the papers, and an inadvertent gasp escaped me. I had known my mother was artistic, but did not appreciate her abilities while I was a child. It was a simple sketch of me at about the age I would have been when she and my father first sent me away. I became fixed on the way she drew my eyes, not with the arrogance or defiance the castle artists inevitably gave me, but with the subtle details only a mother would notice, as if she saw things about her son that everyone else missed. Looking at the pictures, I saw myself the way she must have seen me, and as I gently brushed my thumb over the drawing, I felt her love for me. Then I noticed Connor studying me as I looked at the drawing. I quickly folded it and shoved it in a pocket of my tunic. Connor continued to watch me. Prince Jaron? I scratched my face. Guess I'll have to get used to people calling me that. Do you think I can eventually pick up Sage as a nickname? No, you cannot. Connor smiled and his expression relaxed. But I suppose I should begin calling you Jaron to get you used to it. He hesitated. For a moment there I thought, What's in the other package? I asked. It was a sufficient distraction. Ah! Connor set the box down and began unwrapping the other bundle. This is the proof that will seal your identity. When the prince boarded the ship that day four years ago, he was wearing his crown. It has been lost all this time, assumed to be at the bottom of the sea. Indeed, even if a diver had found it with the intention of putting forward a false prince, the metals and jewels of the crown would have been damaged by the salty waters. But see it for yourself. He finished unwrapping the bundle and pulled out the crown I had last worn on that ship. It was a circlet of gold, with rubies set at the base of every arch, and was trimmed in braided gold bands. The crown had been made for me to grow into, so I suspected it would fit better now than it used to. It was in perfect condition, other than a dent I'd created when I fell from a tree once while wearing it. The pirates rescued this from the ship before it sank, Connor said. They presented it to me as proof of Charon's death. I'd left the crown behind before I snuck off the ship. I had intended it as a symbol of my having abandoned the royal family forever. Face the mirror. Connor said. I obeyed, and watched as he set the crown on my head. The weight of it resurrected a flood of memories for me. As of that moment, I was the prince again, and soon the entire country would know it. 50. Connor's plan was for Cregan to drive him and me directly to the castle in time for the announcement. I argued that Tobias rode in an image and should come with us, but Connor expressly forbade it. So I nodded at Imogen and then shook hands with Rodin. It's not too late to back out. Rodin's grip was powerful. You never wanted this. No, I never did. We had no disagreement there. But this is my future, not yours. A flash of anger crossed Rodin's face but he backed off while I shook hands with Tobias. I think you're supposed to be the king, Tobias said, smiling. The stars are shining for you tonight. He must have felt the note I placed in his palm when we shook hands, and he hid it well when we pulled our hands apart. The ride to the castle was very quiet between Connor and me. He had started our ride by trying to quiz me on any last-minute details. I assured him that I knew everything I had to know and told him to let me have my silence. I watched the castle rise into view as we approached. I hadn't been there in four years, and when I left, I had never expected to see it again. It was one of the younger castles in the surrounding region, and, as such, had borrowed heavily from other countries' architecture. It was built of the large granite blocks from the mountains of Mendenwall, and used the round, heavily decorated turrets of Bymar rather than the plain and square turrets common elsewhere. Like Galin's architecture, the heart of the castle was tall and layered, while its wings were long and square, and small ledges extended beneath the windows. To the people of Carthia, it was the center of their government, a symbol of the king's power, 
and a sign of the prosperity we had always enjoyed. To me, it was home. However, it quickly became apparent that we were not the only ones trying to get through the gates. A dozen carriages were ahead of us in line. One by one, a castle guard spoke to someone in the carriage at the front of the line. A few got through, but most were turned away. Connor leaned his head out the door and signaled to a carriage that had been refused entrance. What's happening? He asked the occupant. Can't say exactly. Whatever I said to the guard, though, he waved us away. Can you imagine such rude treatment? I happen to have the long-lost son of Carthia, Prince Jaron, with me. I started to lean forward to get a look at him myself, but Connor pressed me back into my seat. Do all these carriages hold the missing prince? Connor asked. There are several frauds, I'm afraid. Several carriages contain nobles invited to the castle to greet whatever king is named tonight, and they are allowed through. But my boy, er, the prince, is with me, so they have chosen poorly. Let us hope the correct boy is crowned tonight, Connor said, and then wished him well as our carriage moved forward. When we were alone again, Connor added, his boy looked nothing like Prince Jaron. The guards must be screening for possibilities here at the gate, letting only the most probable candidates through. Don't worry, Sage. Your resemblance is close enough to get us through. I wasn't worried. But when we reached the gate, Connor learned the truth about the screenings. The guard looked at me and arched an eyebrow. At least he was impressed. Who is this? He asked Connor. Prince Jaron of Carthia, as you can plainly see. He must be presented at court before a new king is named. I've seen many Prince Jarons tonight, the guard said. Have you anything else to say? This was a request for a code word. It was an old tradition amongst the royal family to have a code word in the event that an imposter ever tried to enter the castle, or if we had to enter the castle while in disguise. The guards at the gates of the castle were the only other ones who knew the code word even existed. If Connor had known the code, he would have asked if the queen planned to wear green at the dinner tonight, because it was the only color he had brought to match her dress. At least, that had been the code four years ago. All Connor could do was shake his head. I'm sorry, the guard said. You may not enter the castle tonight, but I'm Bevan Connor, one of the twenty regents. Then what I meant to say is that you may enter. The guard flashed a glare at me. The boy with you may not. He is Prince Jaron. They all are. Connor yelled at Cregan to turn our carriage around. Fools! Connor hissed, swatting at the carriage door with his hat. Are we defeated so easily? I leaned back in my seat. There's a secret way into the castle. Connor stopped his swatting. What? How do you know? I've used it. You've been inside the castle? Why didn't you tell me? You never asked. There's a river that flows beneath the kitchen. As food is prepared, the garbage is dumped into the water, and the river carries it away. The river is gated, but there is a key so that the gate can occasionally be cleared of larger obstructions. And you have a key? I pulled a pin from my jacket. Imogen hadn't felt me take it from her hair the night before. I can pick the lock, Connor smiled, impressed with what he thought was my ingenuity. In fact, I'd suspected all along it might come to this. Thus, the pin. Connor's face fell as he further considered my suggestion. We shall be filthy if we go that route, unfit to enter the throne room. That guard just now said you could enter through the gate, I can enter through the kitchen. Connor shook his head. Absolutely not. We must stay together. Which, unfortunately, I also suspected he would say. So I shrugged it off and said, We'll be fine on this route. There's a dirt path to the side of the river, wide enough that we can easily walk there single file. It will lead us to a door into the kitchen. It's never guarded. But we'll need help to restrain the kitchen servants while you and I continue on into the castle. Mott, Tobias, and Rodin. Connor's eyes narrowed. Did you know this would happen? Is that why? I brought them so you wouldn't kill them. There's one other condition. I don't want Cregan coming with us. Order him to stay back. But if he can help, he doesn't come. 
Very well, Connor thought for a moment. How do you know all this? I ate from that kitchen a lot when I was younger. Connor misinterpreted my answer and said, For the first time, Sage, I'm glad to have chosen a thief and an orphan as my prince. Fifty-one. As my note had instructed, Ma, Tobias, Rodin, and Imogen were already waiting at the river entrance into the castle when we arrived. Connor looked surprised to find them there, but must have explained it away in his mind. He called to Cregan. Take this carriage back to the inn and wait for us there. I don't want it here to arouse anyone's suspicions. Have Tobias take it, Cregan said. He's not useful for anything. Then he's not useful for managing a carriage. Get going. We must hurry too, because I fear we'll be late. I led the way up the river. Imogen was behind me, then Connor, then Tobias, Rodin, and Mott at the last. Almost immediately, a roof of dirt and rock rose over our heads as we entered a tunnel leading beneath castle grounds. The castle walls were not much farther ahead. I had found this entrance myself at age eight. The kitchen staff all knew how often I used it to sneak in and out of the castle grounds, but they liked me and never told anyone. I was finally found out when I fell into the river once and returned to the castle smelling of rotten fruit and moldy meat. It smells horrible in here, Tobias said. Nobody promised it'd be pleasant, I called back to him. As it grew darker, Imogen walked closer behind me. I noticed she kept one hand ready to grab my arm if she started to fall in. We reached the gate, which was in desperate need of a cleaning. The gate was clogged with large, rotting chunks of food and debris. It dammed up the water to a higher level of reeking muck than usual. I'm going to be sick, Connor said, covering his nose with a handkerchief. The smell! I hid my smile but do admit I enjoyed the fact that he was having a difficult time. I used the pin to pick the lock within seconds. It was an old lock with soft tumblers. Once I was king, I'd have to order a better security system placed there. We went through the gate, and after another few minutes of walking, I informed the group that we had passed beneath the castle walls. Now that we had come this far, we were provided a little light by occasional oil lamps. When servants came down there, they often had their hands full and needed a lit path. It wasn't much light, but we were grateful for it. How much farther? Connor asked. Not far. Here the path widened, and we were able to walk several persons across. Connor caught up to Imogen and me. Tobias and Mott were behind us, and Rodin lagged behind. Keep up, Rodin, Connor scolded. We are pushing against time. Rodin answered with a shout of surprise. We turned to see what the trouble was. Cregan held him by the neck with his knife. Cregan! Connor yelled. What are you doing? Our group widened into a circle. Mott had his hand on his sword, but he wouldn't draw it. Not unless Connor ordered it. And he'd wounded himself only two nights ago after I'd killed Veldergrath's man. He'd be a weakened opponent if he did have to fight. Change of plans, Cregan said. His mouth curved into a nasty sneer. Your orphan boy won't be king after all. I took a step forward and nodded at Rodin. But why threaten your own choice for King Cregan? Cregan grinned evilly, then released Rodin and handed him his sword. Rodin didn't even have the courtesy to act surprised. He'd known all along that Cregan was following us. You are traitors, Connor said. Traitors to this plan, to Carthia, to me. Why, Cregan? I'm making my fortune. Once Rodin's on the throne, he will make me a noble. Then I'll take your place as regent. Won't be long before I take everything you have. Connor turned his glare to Rodin. After all I've done for you, this is your repayment? You'd have left me at Farthenwood to die, Rodin said stiffly. I owe you nothing. Then I'll have no guilt in ordering your deaths, Connor said. Mott, finish them. Before Mott was able to withdraw his sword, Cregan advanced with his knife and said, 
Mark can't kill both Rodin and me before one of us gets to either you or your phony king. Rodin is better with his sword than you might imagine. I trained him myself. Rodin arched his head. And for that brief time I was your prince, you told me everything I'd need to know to convince the regents. Not everything, Connor said. You won't succeed. Yes, I will, Rodin said. Only Cregan and I go on from here. Hand me the crown, Sage. If you cooperate, everyone leaves in peace. Maybe Rodin believed that, but I could tell from the expression on Cregan's face that he had no plans for any of us to leave here alive. Sir, Maud asked. Other than Cregan and Rodin, he was the only one carrying a weapon. I don't know. For the first time since we met, Connor sounded weak. I didn't expect. We're at a standoff, I said calmly. Maybe you and Rodin will get one of us. But even with your small brain, Cregan, you must know that Mott will get one of you, too. Whether it's you or Rodin who falls, neither of you can win this way. Cregan's face fell. He had not expected us to call his bluff. The stronger of us should be crowned, I continued. Can we all agree on that? Rodin nodded. Hesitantly, Cregan and Connor did as well. Then Rodin and I fight. The winner goes on to the castle. Do you accept the challenge, Rodin? Your back is still injured, Mott warned. Good point. If Rodin wants to make it a fair fight, then how about if I'm the only one with a sword? I grinned, but nobody else liked the joke. Cregan licked his lips savoring the idea of seeing me fall. It was never going to be a fair fight, boy. Rodin's too strong. Rodin looked back at Cregan, then to me. Okay, the winner advances to the throne. Please give me the crown instead, Sage. I don't want to kill you. Lucky coincidence. I don't want to be killed. That infuriated him. Stop making a joke of this as if I'm no threat. I'm better at the sword than you might expect, and I've seen you fight. I removed the crown from my head and handed it to Mott. Don't let it get dirty. Let me have your sword. It's heavier than the prince's was, Mott said. I locked eyes with him. Mott, your sword? With an obedient nod, he handed it to me. Rodin attacked immediately while I was still facing Mott. One of the advantages of being a left-handed person who had been forced to train with his right, I blocked his advance with my left hand, then rotated toward him and struck him hard at his weaker side. Rodin stumbled back with an expression of surprise at my abilities, but he quickly advanced again and swung harder at me. He'd improved significantly since I last fought him, and those were only in practices. This time, his blows were intended to kill and he watched for me to make even the tiniest mistake. You were faking before, he said, parrying my thrust. You've been trained to fight. If you knew my father, you'd know that I was trained for show. He never intended for me to actually fight. Rodin smiled and cut toward me, aiming low. I'm still better than you. Perhaps, but I'm handsomer, don't you think? That took Rodin off guard, and I was able to swing around and kick him in the side. He fell to the ground but kept his sword ready. I started toward him with my blade. All it would take was a quick slash and this match would be over. But I hesitated. Could I strike after promising to save his life if he wasn't chosen as prince? Did I still owe him that? I backed up to higher ground. This match would not end with his death. You could have killed me there, Rodin said leaping to his feet and advancing. Why didn't you? Oh, Rodin came to his own answer. He grinned as he engaged my sword again. I should have known from when you stabbed Veldergrath's man. You don't have the stomach for killing. Unfortunately for you, I do. Then he brought his sword down over his head. The force of his blade crashing against mine set me off balance and I stumbled down the bank. In the limited space we had between the wall and the water, Rodin continued edging me toward the river. I didn't like the idea of falling in. I'd lose the sword fight, and possibly my life. Also, I'd end up smelling really bad. Our blades moved faster and harder, 
but Rodin's confidence was unshakable. If Cregan had chosen him for his natural ability, then he had chosen well. I wished Rodin could be on my side after this, because he'd make an excellent captain of the guard. Finally, my boot hit on a rock, throwing me off balance, and Mott's sword fell from my hand. I dove for it, but it slid into the river. Behind us, Cregan laughed, sensing victory. Rodin lowered his sword and walked up to me, his blade near my throat. I arched my head and backed into a squatting position, but the blade followed me. Do you offer mercy? I asked. If you accept that I win this challenge, if you concede that I win and give me that crown, then you and the others may go in peace. That is the mercy I offer. I am Prince Jaren. If you were Jaren, then you'd never fall for a simple trick like this. I flung my leg to the side and swept it beneath Rodin's feet. He landed on his back with a hoarse groan. I grabbed the rounded edge of the blade and wrenched it from his grasp, then stood and aimed it at his throat. Rodin closed his eyes. It's what you said you would do on your very first day, he mumbled. Beg mercy and trick your opponent. I'd forgotten. No, Cregan yelled. Not him! He ran at me with his knife outstretched. Mott stepped between us and grabbed his hand, twisting it behind his back. To regain his balance, Cregan clutched at the crown in Mott's other hand. Mott stabbed him in the back with the knife and Cregan fell into the water, pulling the crown in with him as well. Blood seeped through the water as both the crown and Cregan's body were carried away downstream. I surrender, Rodin said, lowering his head. Do what you must. I placed a hand on his shoulder and pulled my sword away. I'd have brought you with me into the court, Rodin. We could have been friends. Rodin shook his head. I don't need friends. All I wanted was the throne. Please, just kill me here. My words had been sincere, and it was difficult to remove my hand. Go away then. Run and never find me again. Rodin looked up at me in an attempt to determine whether it was another trick. But I motioned with my head for him to leave and lowered the sword. Wordlessly, Rodin scrambled to his feet and ran out of the tunnel. His footsteps echoed in the tunnel until he'd gotten too far for us to hear him anymore. The crown, Connor said, standing near the edge of the dark water. There's a chance it'll get carried on Cregan's body back to the gate, Tobias said. It's probably sunk already, Connor said. Let me try to find it, Tobias turned to me. Sage, when you are king, let me be one of your servants. Be my friend instead, I said. Go find the crown. Tobias bowed and ran back down the river. Above us, we could hear the faint tolling of bells. The meeting's begun, Connor shouted. We have to hurry. There's only minutes to spare. I started forward, then gasped and stumbled to my knees. You're hurt? Mott cried, then called to Connor. Wait! I can help him. Imogen didn't flinch in the moment of Connor's and Moth's shock at hearing her speak, but continued. You two secure the kitchen and stall the meeting. I can get Sage there. Connor's strained voice revealed the panic he felt. Sage? Just get to that meeting. I looked directly at Mott. Go now! Mott nodded and took Connor's arm. Sir, Prince Jaren will be there. Let's go. I will get there in time, I told Connor. Have Mott secure the kitchen for us. They ran ahead, and Imogen knelt beside me asking, You knew about Rodin and Cregan? How? It was their last chance to make Rodin the prince. She reached for the hem of her skirt, intending to tear off strips for a bandage. Where are you hurt? Nowhere. Everything's fine, really. I smiled and held out my arms to prove it to her. I just needed a reason to get separated from Connor. Do you think Mott has secured the kitchen yet? I don't know. I don't understand. You faked that injury? I've got to go now. There's not much time left. I stood to leave, but she grabbed my arm. Your crown. I won't need it. Sage. Will you make me one promise, Imogen? She pressed her lips together, then said, What is it? This was harder to ask than I'd expected, but I forced the words out. Next time we meet, things will be different. Will you try to forgive me? Forgive you for what? Becoming the prince? 
because I understand now why you're doing it. No, you don't, but you will. If there is any reason to forgive me, will you try to do it? She nodded. There was so much trust in her eyes, so much innocence. She had no idea what she was agreeing to. I kissed her cheek, then said, Wait here until Tobias returns with the crown. With that, he'll be able to get you both through to the throne room. I wish I could take you with me, but this last part I have to do alone. Go then, and may the devils give you clearance. The devils wouldn't be a problem. It was the regents I needed on my side. The False Prince, Disc 7 52 A meeting of the regents was in full progress when Connor breathlessly entered the throne room. He was the only one who had come in late, and his arrival caused an unwelcome disruption. If there were any occasion for you to arrive on time, Lord Connor, this would have been it. The man who spoke was Joth Kerwin, High Chamberlain to King Eckbert. He was almost as much a part of the castle as the bricks and mortar, having served the king for his entire life. He wasn't a large or powerfully built man, quite the opposite in fact. And yet he could command a room of a thousand with just the wave of his hand. There was no one who had been more loyal to King Eckbert, and few who had ever loved Carthia so much. The lines on his aging face told the story of years of worry, and the weight of counseling royalty on their most difficult decisions. Now he was facing the greatest task of his career, peaceably finding a new king for Carthia. Because if civil war broke out amongst the different factions vying for the throne, Carthia's enemies would use the opportunity to advance on the country and destroy it. Connor gave a polite bow to Kerwin. My lord high chamberlain, I had trouble getting here. Forgive me, please. There were nineteen other regents in the room, seated according to their rank at a long rectangular table. Connor's place was near the end, but he hoped that by the close of the evening, he would replace Veldegrath at the head of the table. This was a vain and largely useless group, few who had ever worked a real day in their lives. Even if they knew of the risk and expense Connor had undergone to bring a prince to the throne, they would never appreciate the valiancy of his efforts. Connor had accepted that it was his role to save Carthia, but this collection of stiff-necked, silk-wrapped snobs would never understand that. You may take your seat, Kerwin said. I have already made the announcement formally declaring King Eckbert and his queen and son to be dead. In only moments, the death bell will toll, one round for each royal. Almost immediately, the bell sounded throughout the castle. Their ring would carry beyond the outskirts of the capital city and would signal to the commoners that a royal had died. Three patterns of the bells would confirm the rumors were true. The entire royal family was gone. When the bells fell silent, Kerwin continued. Lords Mead, Beckett, and Hentower, who traveled to Issel this past week, have confirmed for us that Prince Jaren must have died in the pirate attack four years ago. Therefore, we are left with no alternative but to... There is something more to that story. Connor's words were smug and tilted toward the self-righteous. This was a speech he had practiced so often in his head that he could repeat it in his sleep. May I speak, Lord Kerwin? Kerwin nodded permission at him, and Connor stood. With deference to my fellow regents who searched for proof of Jaren's death this past week, they are wrong. Prince Jaren survived the pirate attack four years ago. He still lives. He is the rightful heir to the throne and should be crowned this night the King of Carthia. Veldegraff stood, pointing a long finger at Connor. Then I was right. You did have him hidden at your home. Only for his protection, Lord Veldegraff. Until now. Surely you can see how his being alive may threaten anyone else who hoped to become king tonight. Is that an accusation? Veldergrath began hurling obscenities at Connor. The two regents on either side of him held him back, and other regents around the table murmured loudly to one another. Finally, Kerwin stepped forward. So where is this prince of yours, Lord Connor? He's coming. As I said before, we had trouble getting here. Naturally you did. 
I'm told there were several Prince Charons who had trouble getting here. Connor spoke above the chuckles of his peers. They didn't let anyone through at the gate. No doubt the prince will punish the guards there for failing to recognize him. If he were the prince, he would have known how to get through. The royals always know how to get through. He must have forgotten. Connor's face paled, and he held on to the table for support. But Prince Jaren will be here. Then you'll see. Hearing footsteps in the hallway, he turned to the doors of the throne room expectantly. Almost as if on cue, someone did enter, but it was not who he hoped to see. Maud, Connor said. Only regents are allowed in this meeting, Veldegrath said. You may wait with the other guests and nobles in the Great Hall. That's where the new king will greet his people. But Mott seemed to see only Connor in the room. He isn't here. He came through the kitchen a long time ago. Perhaps your false prince is lost in the castle, another regent said, to laughter in the room. He grew up here. Of course he's not lost. It was an attempt at confidence, but desperation cut too clearly through Connor's words. I propose we continue this meeting, Veldegrath waited until all eyes were on him, and then added, We must not keep the people waiting, and I'm sure whoever is chosen as king will want to speak to Lord Connor on the subject of treason. Then something must have happened in the adjoining room, the great hall where hundreds of citizens had gathered to wait for the announcement of the new king. What had been a steady hum of conversation suddenly fell completely silent. Behind Mott, a castle servant burst through the doors. Forgive me, regents, he said, forgetting the customary bow of his head. But you should all come into the great hall as quickly as possible. Although they were twenty men and women of great status and power, well trained in decorum and manners, no one would have known it by the way they hurried from the throne room. The only one who did not push his way out was Kerwin, who slid through a secret door between the throne room and the great hall. He was the first to see what had caused the entire crowd in the great hall to fall silent. For Prince Jaren was standing at the head of the room. 53. I was in no hurry. All that mattered was the order in which I completed this plan. I stood on the dais at the head of the room, the platform reserved for royalty, or the courtiers required near them in this formal setting. Behind me were the thrones of the king, queen, and Darius. Jaren's throne was no longer here. I wondered how long I'd been gone before it was carried away. The room was filled with a few hundred people, none of whom I recognized, but they clearly recognized me. I had come through a door connecting directly from the private rooms of the royal family. There was no announcement of my arrival, but apparently it hadn't been necessary. Their wide eyes and total silence while staring at me confirmed that. I saw Kerwin come through the door from the throne room, where he and the other regents had been meeting. Him I recognized. He'd hardly changed over the past four years. Still a powerful presence, and someone I'd always respected. From his expression, it was obvious he knew who I was supposed to be, but he seemed to be fighting his own eyes. Who are you? Kerwin asked, cautious as always. The first order of business was to withdraw my sword, the real sword belonging to Prince Jaren. Before leaving the castle four years ago, I had hidden it beneath a loose floorboard in my old room, accessible only by crawling under the bed. My room had remained exactly as it was the night I left. My sword was still there as well, and other than a thin blanket of dust, it looked exactly as it had before. I balanced the sword horizontally on both hands and knelt before Kerwin as he approached me. You know me, Lord Kerwin. I am that boy who burned the throne room, the boy who challenged the King of Mendenwall to a duel. I am the younger Prince of Carthia. I am Jaren. A whisper passed through the room. Kerwin seemed unimpressed, but he was still listening. I stood, but pointed to a nick in the blade of the sword. After I lost the duel to that king, I threw this sword in anger, and it hit a sharp corner of the castle wall. You later returned it to me privately, and said that if I don't respect my sword, no one will respect me. 
Then you apologized because you had also heard what the king said about my mother, but you hadn't dared to challenge him. Kerwin faltered a moment, then recovered. Someone could have overheard that. Perhaps so, but it was I you spoke to that day. Without taking my eyes off his, I reached into my pocket and pulled out a small golden rock. It was the last gift my father had ever given me inside the satchel at the church. Since I stole it back from Connor, it had never been hidden especially well. Anyone who wished to venture high onto the ledges of Farthenwood would have found it. Later, I moved the rock to the bank of the stream on the outskirts of Connor's estate, where it hid in its careful place amongst a thousand other ordinary rocks. This is for you. I pressed the stone into Kerwin's hand. Kerwin turned it over in his hands, unimpressed. Imitator's gold? It's worthless. No, it's real gold. I am real, Lord Kerwin. Tears filled Kerwin's eyes. He pulled a creased and worn paper from his pocket and unfolded it. His hands shook increasingly as he read it. Then he turned to the audience and said, this note was given to me by King Eckbert about a month after Prince Jaren's ship was attacked four years ago. I was instructed to keep it with me at all times, and to read it only if someone ever came forward claiming to be the prince. This is what it says. He read aloud. Many may one day claim to be the lost prince of Carthia. They will be well rehearsed and some may even look the part. You will know Prince Jaren by one sign alone. He will give you the humblest of rocks and tell you it is gold. Kerwin folded the paper again and then said to the audience, Lords and ladies of Carthia, I present to you the son of King Eckbert and Queen Erin. He is the lost royal of Carthia, who lives and stands before you. Hail, Prince Jaren. Then he turned to me and fell to his knees. He took my hand in his and pressed the note into my palm, then kissed the back of my hand. In turn, everyone in the room sank to their knees and said, Hail, Prince Jaren. Kerwin looked up at me, and a single tear fell onto his cheek. Your pants are filthy, as if you rolled in the dirt before coming here. I would expect nothing less from the boy I remember. I smiled. I've come home. Do you know me now? In a crowd of a thousand boys claiming to be the prince, there would be only one with the same look of trouble in his eye. I promise never to forget you again. Suddenly, as well as I thought I had everything planned out, I was at a loss. Should I tell them to rise or issue a command? They were all watching me, waiting for what I'd do next. There was only one person in the room who had failed to kneel. Bevan Connor stood at the back of the room frozen. I walked into the crowd, which stood and magically parted before me. Connor found his words and spoke them slowly. It cannot be. You, I, I suspected it once or twice, but was I blind? You saw who you wanted to see, Connor. Nothing more. He sees nothing but a fraud, and so do I, Veldergraf said from behind me. This is clearly an imposter. I turned and smiled at him. You are relieved of your duties as Prime Regent, Lord Veldegrath. Then to Connor I said, See how I keep my promises? For now, you are my new Prime Regent. Connor didn't return the smile. He was still more frozen than not. You cannot do this! Veldegrath sneered. Who are you really? I heard Connor comb through the orphanages of Carthia. No doubt he found you there amongst the other fleas and vermin. He did. I lived in several orphanages at various times, and went by the name of Sage. Trace my records back as far as you can. You'll find the first entry about four years ago, shortly after Jaren disappeared. Veldergraf laughed at that. So you admit to being one of them? Now you expect me to bow before you? I grinned. You're right. That is funny. Then I laughed with him. Laughed so hard that I put a hand on his shoulder to better share the joke. He didn't appreciate that, and slid my hand away, 
like brushing an earwig off his clothes. With my other hand, I lifted a coin from his vest and then rolled it away on my fingertips. His laughter ceased, and another chorus of whispers echoed through the room. You know me, don't you, Lord Veldergrath? He rubbed his silver ring as the signs of anxiety washed over his face. I nodded at his ring. I stole that from you once, right off your finger. You remember that, I'm sure. It was hours before you noticed. You told my mother I was incorrigible. Apparently little has changed, Veldergrath muttered. More loudly, I asked. Do I have guards in here? Escort Lord Veldergrath out of this castle. I flipped his coin back at him. Come up with any questions you may have to verify my identity. We'll meet again soon, and I promise that I will satisfy you. Two guards appeared on either side of Veldergrath. One took his arm and began to pull him away, but he shrugged them off and said, No, your highness, now that I see you up close, there will be no questions. Then, like a scolded dog, he walked out ahead of the guards. I have questions, a voice said, again behind me. This voice I had also heard before. It was the one person I least wanted to see, though it was the most inevitable. The betrothed Princess Amarinda stood in the center of the aisle I had created by walking there. Her hair was much fancier than the last time we met, piled high on her head and full of curls and ribbon. She wore a square-necked, cream-colored dress, intricately patterned in gold tones and trimmed to match the ribbon in her hair. She would have already heard the bells tolling for the deaths of the royal family. I could only imagine the pain she must have endured this evening, wondering who had been chosen as the new ruler of Carthia, and what he would do about her. No matter what her anticipations might have been for tonight, one thing was certain. She did not expect me. I walked over to her and gave a polite bow. Princess, it is good to see you again. The hard expression on her face made it clear that she did not feel the same way. Aware of the many eyes on us, I moved closer to her and whispered, Can we talk? Her tone was icy. Talk with whom? A brazen servant? A ragged orphan? Or a prince? With me. Here in public? I hesitated, and she added, We'll make a scene if we're only talking. Dance with me. I started to protest, but she was right. A dance might be the best shield for the conversation we had to have, so I nodded at the musicians in the corner to begin a song. With little attempt at concealing her disgust, she took my hand and moved with me to begin the steps. The cut on your cheek is still there, though much improved from what it was before, she finally said. It was never intended that you notice me that night, I explained. Then you should not have spoken to me the way you did. I sometimes lack the talent of knowing when to speak and when to keep quiet. That's not true, she snapped. Then she took a deep breath and fell back into rhythm with the dance. You had every opportunity to be honest with me about the one thing that mattered most. It was no lack of talent. You designed it that way. I never lied to you that night, not once. Even after I begged for it, you failed to tell me the truth. Only the devils know the difference between that and a lie. You have hurt and insulted me. I had no answer to that, and only said, You will never find me dishonest with you again, princess. I hope not. Neither to spare your feelings nor mine. How shall I address you now? You're no longer sage. The dance step called for me to lean to my right. If she noticed me wince from the ache in my ribs, she didn't acknowledge it. When I stood straight, I could speak again. Call me Jaren. You dance like a royal Jaren, better than your brother did. Don't compare me to him. She stiffened. It was my attempt at a compliment. Darius and I are very different people. If you think of him when you think of me... I'll always be a failure to you. Her eyes fluttered, blinking back tears, and we fell into silence. We both knew there was more to be said, much more, and yet we completed the rest of the dance without another word. As the music ended, Amarinda pulled away from me. What happens now for me? Whatever you want, 
I said. All I want is to be happy, she said softly. But I fear that is too much to ask. My smile at her was weak and apologetic. I hadn't caused my brother's death, but I was a consequence of it. We'll talk later, in private. She agreed, though the look of disgust had returned to her face. May I have your permission to leave now? I'm upset and wish to be alone. I nodded at her, and as Amarinda disappeared into the crowd, I was again alone in a sea of strangers. Still at the head of the room, Kerwin said, Your Highness, there must be a ceremony to make your new title official. I regret that your old crown is long lost. I have it! Tobias pushed forward through the crowd, holding something wrapped in a kitchen towel in his arms. He was wet and smelled horrible. I wondered how he'd made it this far into the castle. He stopped when he saw me and bowed. So, you were the prince all along. Why couldn't I see it? Then his face paled. Oh, the crimes I've committed against you. You committed them against an orphan named Sage. You've done nothing to Jaren. Tobias nodded and unwrapped the towel. Your crown, my prince. Connor was suddenly there beside him. He grabbed the crown and said, I am his prime regent. It is my duty to crown him in the ceremony. As we walked forward together, Connor whispered, If you forgive me here, I will serve you forever, on your terms. Jaren. I said nothing, although it did not go the way he had intended. Connor's plan was complete. Mine was not. 54. The ceremony to crown me king went by very quickly. Kerwin produced the Book of Faith, which Connor read from to administer the blessing of the king. When it was finished, Kerwin gave him a ring, which Connor placed on my finger. This belonged to King Eckbert. Connor said, It was your father's. The king's ring. It was heavier than I'd expected made of gold and imprinted with my family crest. It was too large and looked funny on my hand, like something I'd stolen rather than inherited through birthright. Then he lifted from a ruby-red pillow my crown, still wet from having been washed. This is a prince's crown. A new one will be commissioned for you immediately, but it will do for now. He placed it on my head this time with much humbler and gentler hands than had crowned me at the inn. Connor went to his knees again and said, Hail, King Jaren! Hail, King Jaren! the audience echoed. Be a better king than your father was, Connor said softly. You come to the throne at a time of great upheaval. There is always upheaval, I said. Only the reasons for the troubles change. You have the betrothed princess. She will support you. She hates me. So do I, and I just crowned you king. Connor smiled as he said it, but it probably wasn't a joke. I kept my promise to you, I said, still keeping my voice quiet enough so that only he could hear us. You have the position you wanted. You are the true king, Connor said. You may place me anywhere you desire. So I shall. Then more loudly I added, I want the Prime Regent Lord Bevan Connor arrested for the attempted murder of Prince Jaren four years ago. Arrest him for the murder of an orphan boy named Latimer. And also for the murders of King Eckbert, Queen Erin, and Crown Prince Darius. Whispers and hisses flew through the room. Connor turned to me with panic-stricken eyes. No, I didn't. From a pocket of my jacket. I pulled out a small vial. This is oil pressed from the Dervanus flower, I said. It took me a long time to figure out what sort of poison might have killed my family. Entire nights searching through the books in your library. I'm not a great reader, that's true. But if the subject matter interests me, I can comb through books quite quickly. Oddly enough, I found the answer in a book in your bedroom. Dervanus oil is tasteless and requires only a single drop to produce a lethal dose. But it doesn't kill immediately. A person will go to sleep feeling fine and never wake up again. 
Dervanis oil is hard to come by. Yet this was in a strong box in your office. Connor shook his head. Then his eye started left, and he thrust his hand inside his jacket. As I always said, Sage, if I go down, so do you. But he failed to find what he was looking for. He drew back and searched his jacket. I released the cuff of my sleeve, and a knife he had hidden in his jacket fell into my hands. If this is what you wanted, then I shall have to increase the charges against you. Two guards appeared on either side of Connor, and each took his arm. I can't imagine the pleasure you must be taking in this moment, he said nastily. My temper flared. Pleasure? I'm staring at the man who killed my family. Whatever I feel now, trust that pleasure is the furthest from those feelings. You said you were my prince. Is this what that means to you? I am your prince, but I am Carthia's king. You'll understand why, in the hierarchy of my titles, you must lose. Why didn't you tell me from the beginning? If you had told me who you were, then I couldn't have unmasked you. I'd have doomed my own rule, just as my family was doomed. Behind me, Kerwin sighed. Addressing Connor, he said, What if Jaren had been only an orphan? Surely you couldn't have expected him to fool the court for long. He didn't need much time. I said, keeping my eyes on Connor. He needed a prince only long enough to get himself named Prime Regent. No matter what happened afterward, he would become the controlling power in Carthia. Well done, Connor said. Jaron was always described as a clever boy, but I underestimated you. I started to wave my hand to dismiss him, but Connor quickly added, You are guilty of crimes too, your majesty. Facing him full on, I arched an eyebrow. Oh? Even when you said you didn't want the throne, you were all that time plotting to get it. You lied to me. Anger surged through me, and I didn't disguise it well. I leaned close to him and hissed. I did tell you lies, Master Connor, but none of consequence. I was telling the exact truth when I said I had no desire to be king. If there were anyone, anyone, I felt could take my place without the entire kingdom's collapse, I would gladly step aside. If I could return to be that boy you snatched from the orphanage, I'd leave now and never look back. If you knew what it meant to be king. I sighed and shook my head. Of all Carthians, I am the least free. And what of my freedom? Connor asked. Shall I beg for mercy? Beg mercy from the devils. I spoke more calmly now. You said you would sell your soul to them for this plan. Your plan worked, and the devils may have you. If the devils have me, then you are their king. Connor spat at me. I will forever curse the day we met. Take him to the prison, I told my guards. He will be there for some time. Connor... It appears you will be unavailable to fulfill your duties as Prime Regent. Therefore, you are relieved of that position and stripped of your title as a noble. Once Connor was dragged out of the room, I directed the musicians to play. Then, exhausted, I fell into my father's throne. No, my throne. I was king now. The reality of that was incomprehensible. One by one, the various members of the audience came forward to greet me personally. I didn't know most of them, though I recognized several of their family names. They had been of little interest to me when I was ten, and weren't much more interesting now. You have come home to a country that mourned your loss these past four years, Kerwin said, standing beside me. See your people celebrate you. Will you join them? It wasn't that simple. I still feel like the boy in the orphanage, I murmured. I'm lost here. But this is your home. I traced my finger along a carving in the armrest of the throne. It was my home because my family was here. I'm alone now, and I don't know where to begin. You are still young, Jaren. Perhaps a steward would be appropriate. I'm king now, no one else. Kerwin dipped his head in acknowledgement of that, and stared with me across the audience. Quietly, he said, Not everyone will welcome your return. 
The enemies at our borders will feel tricked. There will be anger. I know. War is coming, Jaren. A fact I understood down to my very bones. Despite that, I looked up at him and cocked an eyebrow. But surely their spies cannot travel so fast as to ruin this night. There is still a little time to laugh. He started to object, but I stood and said, They must see me laugh, Kerwin, at least for tonight. With that, I walked into the audience. Again, they parted for me. This time, I saw the person I'd been looking for all evening. Imogen stood at the back of the room, looking very small and frightened. When I approached her, she lowered herself into a bow and remained that way. Please rise, I said. It's still me. She obeyed but shook her head. No, I don't think it is. How much did you see? All of it, your highness. Must you call me that? Her voice faltered. I must. Do you forgive me? Can you? She lowered her eyes. If you command it, then I will. What if I don't command it? Please don't ask me that. Kerwin came up beside me. And who is this, King Jaren? I took her hand and led her to the center of the group. She is a lady in disguise, just as I was disguised as an orphan for four years. She is Imogen, and her family has debts to Master Connor. She has fully repaid those debts to me these past two weeks, in expert nursing care and compassion. Her father is dead, but using my power as king... I posthumously declare him a nobleman of Carthia. She is a nobleman's daughter and will be treated as such. Imogen shook her head. No, don't. I can't repay this. I turned to her and lowered my voice. Imogen, you owe me nothing. You are free, and I wish you well in life. I gave her hand to Kerwin. Will you see that she is given a comfortable room and dressed to fit her title? She may stay as long as she wishes and at whatever point she asks it, see that she has provided a way home. She smiled through her tears and bowed to me. Thank you, King Jaren. I smiled back at her. Thank you, Imogen. I wouldn't have survived these past two weeks except for you. Kerwin led her away, but when he looked back at me, I could almost see a new weight fall upon his shoulders. Difficult times were ahead. For Carthia and for me. But even pending war should never ruin a good party. With a smile on my face, I turned to the group and said, Carthians, tonight I am home again. Let it be a celebration. Tonight we dance. <laughs>